Like some? I would. Thank you. Thank you. Are there enough cups? Would you like some water? Nice to meet you. Uh, good morning. The Judiciary Committee will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized uh, to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. I'm going to recognize myself for an opening statement, then the Ranking Member, and then the Chairman and the Ranking Member of the appropriate subcommittee. <clears throat> Today's hearing is on legislation that will help protect one of the most productive sectors of the American economy. While the Digital Millennium Copyright Act does provide some relief to copyright owners whose works are infringed, it only helps in limited circumstances. The DMCA provides no effective relief when a rogue website is foreign-based and foreign-operated like the Pirate Bay, the 89th most visited site in the U.S. It doesn't protect trademark owners and consumers from counterfeit and unsafe products like fake prescription medicines and misbranded drugs that are often presented to the public by unlicensed online pharmacies. Nor does the law assist copyright owners when rogue websites contribute to the theft of intellectual property on a massive scale. 
And finally, it does nothing to address the use of certain intermediaries, such as payment processors and Internet advertising services, that are used by criminals to fund illegal activities. Mr. That's Chairman, where the stop. Mr. Chairman, I'm having trouble hearing your statement. Can you? I wouldn't want anyone to miss my statement, so I'll make sure that the sound system is working and that I'm close enough to the mic. Turn his mic way up. Okay. That's where the Stop Online Piracy Act comes in. This bill focuses not on technology, but on preventing those who engage in criminal behavior from reaching directly into the U.S. market to harm American consumers. We cannot continue a system that allows criminals to disregard our laws and import counterfeit and pirated goods across our physical borders. Nor can we fail to take effective and meaningful action when criminals misuse the Internet. The problem of rogue websites is real, immediate, and widespread. It harms all sectors of the economy, and its scope is staggering. One recent survey found that nearly one quarter, one quarter of global Internet traffic infringes on copyrights. A second study found that 43 sites classified as digital piracy generated 53 billion visits per year, and that 26 sites selling just counterfeit prescription drugs generated 51 million hits annually. Since the United States produces the most intellectual property, our country has the most to lose if we fail to address the problem of these rogue websites. Responsible companies and public officials have taken note of the corrosive and damaging effects of rogue websites. One of our witnesses today represents MasterCard Worldwide, a company that takes seriously its obligation to reduce the amount of stolen intellectual property on the Internet. MasterCard deserves thanks for its commitment to support legislation that addresses the problems of online piracy. In contrast, another one of the companies represented here today has sought to obstruct the committee's consideration of bipartisan legislation. Perhaps this should come as no surprise, given that Google just settled a federal criminal investigation into the company's active promotion of rogue websites that pushed illegal prescription and counterfeit drugs on American consumers. In announcing a half-billion-dollar forfeiture of illegal profits, the U.S. attorney, Peter Nerona, who led the investigation, stated, quote, suffice it to say that this is not two or three rogue employees at the consumer service level doing this. This was a corporate decision to engage in this conduct, end quote. Over several years, Google ignored repeated warnings from the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy and the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University that the company was violating federal law. The company also disregarded requests to block advertisements from rogue pharmacies, screen such sites from searches, and provide warnings about buying drugs over the Internet. The Wall Street Journal reports Mr. Nerona characterized Google's efforts to appear to control unlawful advertisements as window dressing, since, quote, it allowed Google to continue earning revenues from the allegedly illicit ad sales, even as it professed to be taking action against them, end quote. Given Google's record, their objection to authorizing a court to order a search engine to not steer consumers to foreign rogue sites is easily understood. Unfortunately, the theft of America's intellectual property cost the United States economy more than $100 billion annually and results in the loss of thousands of American jobs. Under current law, rogue sites that profit from selling pirated goods are often out of the reach of U.S. law enforcement agencies and operate without consequences. The Stop Online Piracy Act helps stop the flow of revenue to rogue websites and ensures the profits from American innovations go to American innovators. Protecting America's intellectual property will help our economy create jobs and discourage illegal websites. That concludes my opening statement, and the gentleman from Michigan, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, is recognized for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Smith, and good morning to my fellow colleagues on the committee. Uh, this is a very important hearing, and I want to commend you on your statement because you raised some issues that I think we will have to go into quite carefully. 
Uh, now, there have been attempts to uh, deal with the problem that's before us today. Uh, but H.R. 3261, Stop Online Piracy Act, uh, represents a great deal of work and some experience from our attempts to deal with this subject before. I am very pleased that this is a bipartisan bill. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's very important. Now, there have been a number of uh, attempts uh, to stop online intellectual property theft and fraud. Uh, some of the leading internet service providers and right holders and the best practices standards that are being developed uh, uh, within uh, the advertising network and payment processing companies uh, and particularly MasterCard have all come to my attention. I commend them. Uh, but this private cooperation is not sufficient. Our studies have shown that upwards of one quarter of all internet traffic is copyright infringing. And to those who say that, that a bill to stop online theft will break the internet, I, I'd like to point out uh, that, that uh, it's uh, not likely to happen. Uh, users connect to the internet through service providers like AT&T and Verizon. But by most accounts, and I have to bring up Google's name again in the beginning of this discussion, Google's search engine connects users to internet content more often than any other and places the most advertisements. As users surf the web, their com computers connect with domain name servers uh, to resolve the site name uh, that they type into their browser and its location on the web. Now, uh, we're getting a number of reactions from this proposal. Uh, some right holders have said that the market-based process outlined in section 103 of the bill doesn't go far enough and, Im and immunizes too many players who profit from piracy. But on the other hand, there are some in the technology section that have said this bill will break the internet and strangle startups and Silicon Valley giants alike. And so I relu reluctantly ask to put this into the record. <laughs> uh, uh, the attack of the internet killers. Uh, this is without objection. That'll be made. It's very serious business. Uh, don't walk, run. Tell Congress there's a better way. Threatens global internet security. Kills cloud computer, and an American job crushing monster. That's our bill, HR 3261. Isn't that a comic? <laughs> No, this is serious. Uh, 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 it's, a, it's a terrible thing, and that we, we ought to know better. Now, on, on a more serious note, uh, we have from our friends in the American Civil Liberties Union a, uh, a, a caution that I have to take more seriously because uh, they have uh, some questions uh, that they I don't, I don't think I think needs to be examined here and that is uh, the first is that there's an attorney general section of the bill that only the justice department in its wisdom, can ask a court to filter or block web content. 
what the American Civil Liberties Union is telling us is that we will, with this legislation, inadvertently involve non-fringing uh, operators and that this uh, would, uh, would violate their constitutional rights. Now against that, I'm going to ask uh, to put in uh, the uh, eminent First Amendment scholar Floyd Abrams uh, recommendation that says that the notion that this bill threatens freedom of expression is insupportable. It protects creators of free speech, as Congress has done uh, and the Judiciary Committee especially has been particularly uh, sensitive to protecting. And so I ask unanimous consent to put in the uh, statement of Attorney Floyd Abrams. And I yield back the balance of my time. Without thank objection, you. thank you, Mr. Conyers. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, the chairman of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing and thank you for your leadership on this issue. For more than two centuries, America's economic strength has been built on a firm foundation. The rule of law, respect for individuals and private property, and the promotion of industry through policies that reward creativity and innovation are essential virtues that help the fledgling nation encourage the initiative of its citizens and in time emerge as the most advanced and prosperous on earth. These virtues are not universal. In an increasingly connected world, threats that emanate from areas where these principles are not shared are jeopardizing our ability to sustain the incentives needed to foster growth and development and advance human progress. These threats create challenges for us in both the physical world and the virtual world where the systematic and willful violation of intellectual property rights now poses a clear, present, and growing danger to American creators and innovators, U.S. consumers, and our collective confidence in the Internet ecosystem. In order to continue to incentivize artists, authors, and inventors, we need to ensure that these creators have the ability to earn a return on their investments. Increasingly, foreign piracy is stripping creators of that ability. Within the Internet ecosystem today, there are legitimate commercial sites that offer consumers authorized goods and services. Indeed, many exciting new technologies and websites help content owners distribute music, movies, books, games, software, and other copyrighted works in ways that were not even imaginable 10 years ago. However, there are also rogue sites that steal the intellectual property of others and traffic in counterfeit and pirated goods. In recent years, these websites have grown and evolved. They've become increasingly sophisticated and rival legitimate sites in appearance, operation, and indicia of reliability. U.S. consumers are frequently led to these sites by search engines that list them among the top search results. After clicking on a site, they are immediately reassured by the logos of U.S. payment processors and the presence of major corporate advertising supporting the site. These sites sell infringing copyrighted works, but they are not limited to those. Increasingly, these sites also offer counterfeit goods, such as counterfeit automobile parts, medicines, baby formula, and other products that can pose serious threats to the health and safety of American citizens. What's worse, these rogue sites often list the real customer service contact information for the legitimate companies, which deteriorates the reputation of the legitimate maker of these goods. For all these reasons, I have joined Chairman Smith in introducing the Stop Online Piracy Act, which creates new tools for law enforcement to combat these growing threats. Specifically, this legislation gives law enforcement the authority to bring an action in a federal court to declare a website in violation of the law and allows the court to issue a court order to intermediaries to block transactions and access to those sites found to be infringing. The bill also provides content owners with a limited liability to request a court to declare a website as violating the law. However, the content owners must first attempt to work directly with financial services and advertising intermediaries to solve the problem. Only if those parties cannot reach agreement are content owners allowed to seek a court declaration against an infringing website. It is my hope that this provision will allow content owners and intermediaries to work together to root out infringing sites quickly. It should be noted that there has been criticism from many in the online community about the scope of this bill, its effect on the functioning of the Internet, 
and that it could entangle legitimate websites. It's my, it is not my intention to do so, and I stand ready to work with the tech community to address any legitimate concerns they have. I have requested detailed comments from the tech community about their concerns and look forward to continuing to work with them and Chairman Smith and other members of the Judiciary Committee to ensure that this legislation punishes lawbreakers while protecting content owners as well as legitimate online innovators and startups. Mr. Chairman, this is a good bill, but a number of issues raised about it need to be carefully addressed. I look forward to working with you on those issues as we move forward to protect content owners online, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Goodlatte. Uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Watt, the ranking member of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, in my experience, there's usually only one thing at stake when we have long lines outside a hearing as we do today. And when giant companies like those opposing this bill and their supporters start throwing around rhetoric like this, is, this bill will kill the Internet or it's an attempt to build the great firewall of America. And that one thing is usually money. While I appreciate that the stakeholders of Internet companies that have market caps in the billions of dollars care, as we all do, about the First Amendment and other precious rights, it seems clear to me that the obstinate opposition we have seen in the days since introduction of the Stop Online Piracy Act is really about the bottom line. Piracy and counterfeiting make money, and lots of it. This is not speculative. Sites that specialize in stolen goods attract a lot of eyeballs which in turn attracts a lot of advertising, which in turn means, well, you got it, lots of money. To be fair, many of the copyright and trademark owners who want this bill to help enforce their rights are also businesses and are also motivated by money. But in my mind, stopping theft of your work or products is an appropriate incentive to secure profits but doing nothing or next to nothing to prevent theft through the use of tools a company creates or controls is not an appropriate incentive to secure profits. So as policymakers, our goal must be to confront the criminal enterprises that are flourishing on the internet, stealing from the rights holders and visiting untold harms on consumers. Doing nothing is not an option. Not only are online piracy and counterfeiting drains on our economy, they expose unwary consumers to fraud, identity theft, confusion, and at worst, physical harm. The penetration of hazardous products and goods into the American marketplace, including our military supply chain, poses an unacceptable risk of serious bodily injury or death to our citizens. Tolerance of online theft of music, movies, and software reinforces a culture of entitlement, stifles creativity, injures artists, and undermines job stability and growth. While I have never been a big advocate of current seizure laws, why would we not, as this bill does, give the Attorney General, at a minimum, the same power to block foreign thieves from access to the U.S. markets as the Attorney General has for domestic markets? Given the limits of government resources, why should we not establish a framework to enable rights holders to engage specific intermediaries within the Internet ecosystem to meet the challenges of online piracy and counterfeiting. I think one of the big problems here is that to date, the economic incentives for the big internet companies to work against online piracy are just not there. To be sure, there are many intermediaries that are inadvertently involved with pirate sites and who have come to the table with constructive suggestions for crafting a balanced bill that will work. I commend the ISPs, payment processors like MasterCard, who's here today, and Visa, GoDaddy, who is the largest registrar of domain names, 
and a number of software companies who have raised reasonable concerns and are willing to work together to address them. But again, when I hear overblown claims like this bill is a, quote, giveaway to greedy trial lawyers or a killer of innovation and, and entrepreneurs, that the co-sponsors of this bill are the internet killers, I become suspicious of the message as well as the messengers. And as one who cares deeply about the constitutional guarantees of free speech and due process, it is beyond troubling to hear hyperbolic charges that this bill will open the floodgates to government censorship. That's simply not the world we live in and to suggest that by establishing a means to combat theft of intellectual property online, we will somehow devolve into a repressive regime uh, belittles the circumstances under which true victims of tyrannical government actually live. I urge everyone to set aside all the hyperbole and accusations. I'm the first to admit that I don't like or love everything about this bill. But it's very strong, it's a very strong, solid effort to begin the process of responsibly providing the Attorney General and rights holders with necessary tools to keep pace with and ultimately to outpace the high-tech bandits roving the internet. I believe there are still some things we can do in the legislation to avoid un unintended consequences maintain the integrity of the internet and preserve certain freedoms including many of the specific suggestions made by the ranking member our staffs have worked closely together to identify ways to improve this bill and we will continue to do so and i appreciate the fact that crafting a bill governing online in the online environment requires attention mm -hmm. to technological details but I start from the premise that internet freedom does not and cannot mean internet lawlessness and that the goals of freedom and lawfulness are no more incompatible in, in the internet space than they are in the physical world. Mr. Chairman, there's an African per, uh, uh, proverb that says, when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. Perhaps if we refocus this debate on the ills that may befall innocent consumers who fall prey to the perils of pirated and counterfeited goods, rather than on the balance sheets of all the big companies, we can reach a worthy compromise. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses and engaging in ongoing dialogue as we move the bill forward. The stakes for America and American consumers are too high to get engaged in too much hyperbole. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Watt. Uh, with that objection, other members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. We welcome our distinguished panelists today, and I will now introduce them. Our first witness is Maria Palante, the Register of Copyrights. Ms. Palante was appointed by the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington, as the 12th Register on June 1st of this year. Immediately prior to that appointment, Ms. Palante served as the acting register. As register, Ms. Palante continues the tradition of serving as the principal advisor to Congress on matters of copyright policy. Ms. Palante has spent much of her career in the office where she previously served as the associate register for policy and international affairs, deputy general counsel, and policy advisor. In addition, Ms. Palante spent nearly a decade as intellectual property counsel and director of licensing for the Guggenheim Museums in New York. She earned her law degree from George Washington University and her bachelor's degree from Misericordia University, where she was also awarded an honorary degree of humane letters. Our second witness is John P. Clark, the Vice President of Global Security and Chief Security Officer for Pfizer. Since joining Pfizer in 2008, Mr. Clark has been recognized as a leading authority on the threat that counterfeit medicines pose to patient health and safety. Prior to joining Pfizer, Mr. Clark served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement 
In that capacity, he was responsible for overall management and coordination of the agency's operation, and he served as the Assistant Secretary's principal representative to the Department of Homeland Security and to the law enforcement and intelligence communities. Starting as a U.S. Border Patrol agent in 1980, Mr. Clark spent more than 25 years as a law enforcement professional before retiring from public service. A New York native, Mr. Clark received his Bachelor of Science degree in History from the State University of New York at Birmingham and a Master of Science degree from uh, National Lewis University. Before joining DOJ, whoop, our third witness is Michael O'Leary, the Senior Executive Vice President for Global Policy and External Affairs at the Motion Picture Association of America. In that position, Mr. O'Leary supervises all international, federal, and state affairs operations around the world for the association. Before moving to MPAA, Mr. O'Leary served more than a dozen years at the Department of Justice, where he worked on legislative, intellectual property, and enforcement issues. During his tenure at the DOJ, he served as the Deputy Chief of the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section, where he prosecuted and supervised some of the most significant domestic and international criminal and IP cases undertaken by the Department. Before joining DOJ, Mr. O'Leary spent five years serving as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. He grew up in Montana and is a graduate of Arizona State University and the University of Arizona School of Law. Our fourth witness is Ms. Linda Kirkpatrick, who serves as the Group Head of Customer Performance Integrity at MasterCard Worldwide. In this role, Ms. Kirkpatrick is responsible for driving the strategy, development, and execution of global customer compliance programs, data integrity, and dispute resolution management. Ms. Kirkpatrick has been with MasterCard since 1997. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics with a concentration in Finance from Manhattanville College in Purchase, New York. Our fifth witness is Catherine Oyama, a policy counsel for Google, where she focuses on copyright and trademark law and policy. From 2009 to early 2011, she worked in the office of the Vice President as Associate Counsel and Deputy Counsel to Vice President Joseph R. Biden. Prior to her government service, Ms. Oyama was a litigation associate with Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Dorr, where she worked on intellectual property cases, government regulatory litigation, and pro bono matters. She previously worked in the media and entertainment practice of a New York-based strategy consulting firm for the Silicon Valley-based internet startup LoudCloud, Inc., and for the Texas-based company Electrona Data Systems. Ms. Oyama is a graduate of Smith College, where she graduated with honors in government and the University of Cal Berkeley School of Law, where she served as senior articles editor of the Berkeley Technolog Technology Law Journal. Our final witness is Paul Almeida, the president of the, of the Department of Professional Employees of the AFL-CIO. Mr. Almeida has served as president of the DPE since February 2001. Prior to his tenure with DPE, Mr. Almeida served as president of the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers for seven years. Mr. Almeida earned his degree in engineering from Franklin Institute in Boston, and he resides in Arlington, Massachusetts. Uh, we welcome you all. Um, every member of the panel will have five minutes to give their testimony, and we have a light on the table to indicate when that time is about to expire and has expired. Uh, again, we welcome you, and Ms. Palante will begin with you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to appear today, and I would also like to thank you, Ranking Member Conyers, uh, Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Watt of the subcommittee, and all of the members of the committee for your continued leadership on copyright policy. Congress has updated the Copyright Act many times in the past 200 years, including the enforcement provisions. But as we all know, this work is never finished. Infringers today are sophisticated and they are bold. They blatantly stream and disseminate books, music, films, and software through websites using the services of trusted search engines, advertising networks, and credit card companies. This is not a problem that we can accept. In my view, it is about the rule of law on the internet. Much of the bill employs a strategy of follow the money. I testified in support of this approach in March, and I still agree that it is an important part of the equation. Many sites make money by selling illegal access to copyrighted works or by offering related advertising. But the approach does have some limitations. Many of the worst sites do not sell infringing content. They offer it for free. And they do not run ads. I would like to offer an example involving Google, but I would first like to say 
that I have a great deal of respect for Google, and I cannot imagine the internet without it. However, if you conduct a search for the phrase download movies, Google search engine will supply the words for free. And it will return a list of sites that offer illegal copies or streams at no charge and with no advertising. These cases require a different kind of strategy than follow the money. The same is true when damage is imminent. For example, when a site is streaming live sporting events or selling movies before they have been released to the public. In the context of foreign infringing sites, the bill addresses this problem by giving the Department of Justice the power to require search engines to dismantle direct hyperlinks and to require service providers to block the access of subscribers within the United States. These actions require court approval and incorporate the existing legal standards of seizure and civil forfeiture law. These are the same standards that ICE has used effectively for operation in our sites. Mr. Chairman, I do not want to suggest that blocking websites is a small step. It is not. And the public interest groups that oppose this part of the bill are right to be concerned about unintended consequences. However, it may ultimately come down to a question of philosophy for Congress. If the Attorney General is chasing 21st century infringers, what kinds of tools does Congress want to provide? How broad and how flexible? The bill also gives copyright owners some tools, but these do not involve search engines or ISPs, and I think that this is the right calibration. Put another way, the bill re reflects the fact that many industries contribute to the success of the Internet, and it properly distinguishes between the actions that law enforcement and private citizens can bring. One of the more interesting aspects of the bill is that before authors or other copyright owners can seek court orders, it requires them to alert payment processors and ad networks about infringing content and request that they sever financial ties. This approach is creative and it provides incentives for the parties to cooperate. It also allows for counter notification. However, whether the notification system is ultimately effective will largely depend upon whether it can be implemented in a manner that is clear and fair for all involved. The intermediaries at issue are running businesses in good faith, and the websites at issue are entitled to due process. The bill does incorporate due process where court orders are involved. The notification system would operate outside the purview of a court, and therefore it may benefit from further due process review. Finally, I do not believe it is the intent of the bill to negate the safe harbors of the DMCA, and I do not read it that way. Nothing subjects ISPs to liability for their acts or their failures to act. No monetary relief can be obtained. And the injunctive relief permitted by the bill appears to be consistent with what the DMCA already permits. This said, the bill has many moving parts, and I note that a number of stakeholders with differing perspectives have offered productive suggestions. As the committee works to refine the bill, I would encourage you to fully consider these suggestions. However, in closing, I would also like to state that I believe that Congress has a responsibility to protect the exclusive rights of copyright owners, and I hope that you will advance the bill with this in mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Palante. Mr. Clark. Chairman, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Conyers, distinguished members of the committee. Can you pull the mic a little bit closer, please, uh, or cut it on? It's a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss the threat that counterfeits medicines pose to the health and safety of patients in the United States and around the world. It's a global issue. As Vice President of Global Security for Pfizer, I work to mitigate the threat that counterfeit medicines pose to the health and safety of patients who rely on Pfizer medicines to live healthier and longer lives. I commend the Chairman, the Ranking Member, and the Committee um, for co-sponsoring the Stop Online Piracy Act for their legislative effort. It's a positive step forward in our fight against counterfeit medicines. Counterfeit medicines pose a threat because of the conditions under which they are manufactured in unlicensed, unregulated sites, frequently under unsanitary conditions. In many instances, they contain none of the active pharmaceutical ingredients found in authentic medicine or in incorrect dosages, depriving patients of the therapeutic benefit of the, of the medicine prescribed by their physicians. In others, they may contain toxic ingredients such as heavy metals, arsenic, pesticides, rat poison, brick dust, floor wax, 
leaded highway paint, and even sheetrock or wallboard. Counterfeit medicines are a global problem. I'm pleased to share our experience in combating them and how the Stop Online Privacy, Piracy Act aims to strengthen the U.S. arsenal. Pfizer has implemented an aggressive anti-counterfeiting campaign that attacks counterfeits at their source. Since 2004, we've prevented more than 138 million dosages of counterfeit Pfizer medicines alone, more than 68 million finished dosages and enough active pharmaceutical ingredient to manufacture another 70 million from reaching global patients. Additional raids by law enforcement based on evidence we have provided have also resulted in seizures of millions of dosages of counterfeits marketed by other major pharmaceutical companies. In the United States, we work closely with ICE, the FBI, and FDA on their investigations and with Customs and Border Protection to improve their ability to prevent counterfeit Pfizer medicines from reaching U.S. patients. While the true scope of the counterfeit problems is hard to estimate, we have confirmed that counterfeit Pfizer medicines have been found and seized in at least 101 countries and have breached the supply chains in 53 countries. Technology has created a new front in this battle. Today, the major threat to patients in the U.S. are the many professional-looking websites that promise safe, FDA-approved, branded medicines from Canada, Canada or the U.K. And for that reason, we appreciate the chairman and ranking members' focus on the threat in Title I of the bill, giving the Attorney General new tools and incentivizing private stakeholders to act against rogue websites with immunity in place for every stakeholder's action would be an important step forward. Patients don't realize that many of the websites don't disclose the true source of the products they dispense or even where their, the alleged dispensing online pharmacy is located. In such instances, the World Health Organization has estimated that patients have more than a 50% chance of receiving a counterfeit medicine. I happen to believe that that's a very low estimate. I'd like to share two short case studies. The first is Rx North. Patients who visited Rx North website say, thought they were ordering from a Canadian pharmacy and would receive authentic FDA-approved medicines. In reality, the medicines dispensed from Rx North were traced from China, where they were manufactured, through Hong Kong, on to Dubai, and to the UK, where they were intercepted. <laughs> Among the medicines seized by UK Customs were Lipitor, found to contain only 82 to 86 percent of the active pharmaceutical ingredient which is an incredibly high number for most counterfeits, as well as counterfeit versions of medicines from four other companies, including one to, found to contain trace, traces of metal. Second is the case of Kevin Zhu, convicted of misbranding drugs and trafficking in counterfeit goods. It demonstrates how attractive a target the U.S. supply chain is for those who counterfeit our medicines and how weak our current penalties for counterfeiting medicine are. During meetings with our undercover consultant, Zhu boasted of the global scope of his criminal enterprise. He offered a list of branded medicine, counterfeit medicines that he could provide, including five Pfizer medicines. The evidence we gathered was shared with an ongoing ICE investigation of Zhu. An order placed by an ICE undercover agent was filled with, only count, with a counterfeit. When the tablets were tested, they were found to contain only an insignificant levels of the active pharmaceutical ingredient found in the authentic medicine. Zhu was sentenced to just 78 months in federal prison without parole the maximum sentence under the applicable U.S. Sentencing Commission guideline range. This punishment does not reflect the seriousness of the crime. The Stop Online Piracy Act takes a positive step toward making these penalties even tougher. Pharmaceutical counterfeiting is a low-risk, high-profit criminal activity that has attracted drug traffickers, firearm smugglers, and terrorists. One of the principal players in the 2003 Lipitor breach here in the U.S. was a convicted cocaine trafficker. In 2006, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan announced the indictment of 19 people who gave a portion of their profits from the sale of counterfeit Viagra to Hezbollah. Those who counterfeit medicines are confident that even if caught, they'll get just a slap on the wrist. Even here in the U.S., the maximum sentence imposed under the Food and Drug Cosmetics Act is just three years. Recognizing the inherent risk that any counterfeit medicine poses to patients, we must enhance the penalties for pharmaceutical counterfeiting to provide a greater deterrent. Expedited procedures must be in place to shut down rogue websites dispensing counterfeit medicines to the U.S. The Stop Online Piracy Act is a significant step forward in those efforts, and I thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for introducing this important piece of legislation. I'd like to work with you so that our laws recognize the grave health and safety risks posed by counterfeit medicines and serve as a deterrent. I work with foreign government representatives in the global fight against counterfeiting. 
it's hypocritical for us to speak with foreign government representatives, as I often do, about their lack of effective legislation when U.S. law is still lacking. This bill, if enacted with strong penalties and mechanisms to shut down rogue websites, will be highly effective in our global argument for all governments to fully appreciate the serious health and safety aspects of this problem and encourage similar efforts around the world. Thank you again for this opportunity to express my views. For Pfizer, pharmaceutical counterfeiting is first and foremost an issue of patient health and safety. We look forward to working with you on the global fight against counterfeit medicines. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Conyers, uh, Chairman Goodlatte, and Ranking Member Watt, distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to be here, and thank you for holding this important hearing. I uh, also want to thank you for introducing this legislation, which will help protect American creativity and American jobs from thieves who hide overseas and seek to profit off the hard work of people in this country. I also want to acknowledge my fellow panelists. I'm pleased to be here with all of them today and look forward to working with them throughout this process. I want to particularly acknowledge the contributions of Ms. Kirkpatrick and MasterCard. As the chairman alluded to earlier, they are truly uh, a fine example of a corporation trying to make the Internet a safe uh, marketplace for people all over the world, and frankly, their example is one to be followed. Critics would have you, as, as Mr. Watt alluded to, believe that this is a battle between two giant corporations, and there's certainly a lot of truth to that, but I'm also very proud to be part of a, a wide-ranging coalition that includes the AFL-CIO, who we'll hear from shortly, members of the Chamber of Commerce, big business, small business, individual creators and entrepreneurs. So I think critics would have you believe that this bill is really about supporting Hollywood and, and things like that. But the truth of the matter, when you look behind the rhetoric and the hyperbole, is that it goes intellectual property is something which affects every facet of the American economy, and it affects people all over the country. Um, in case of the, the industry that I represent, the American motion picture and television industry, we believe that these jobs are worth protecting. They're more fully detailed in my written testimony, but I would just mention a few. There are people like Dan Lemieux, who's a stunt coordinator from Michigan. He's worked on numerous films, television shows like Nip Tuck, The Shield. The industry includes over 95,000 small businesses. They employ 10 people or less. Businesses like Fletcher Camera, which is in Chicago, they have 25 employees in that small business, and they provide movie equipment for productions that occur all over the, all over the Midwest. There are hundreds of thousands of businesses that provide services to productions. There's a small paint and decorating firm in Baltimore, Maryland. It's a fifth-generation family-run operation, and it has supplied paint for virtually every major production which has occurred in the Mid-Atlantic Mid region over the past few years. I want to be very clear with this committee that hard work, innovation and creativity are not solely the province of people who live in Northern California. There are people all over this country who contribute to the economy every day, who contribute to our culture, who contribute to what we make creatively, and their jobs are just as important and just as worth protecting as anyone else's. And that's why we think this bill is so important, because it's a positive step in that direction. In this economic climate, we simply cannot afford to turn our back on any industry which is coming forward and producing things that, are, that we can take all over the world and be successful with. Our industry competes. When we are given an opportunity to compete globally, we succeed. Where we have trouble, frankly, Mr. Chairman, is where we don't have an opportunity to compete fairly. And one of the problems we have is competing with people who are trying to steal our stuff. We're not before the Congress looking for a handout or a bailout. We're simply asking for an opportunity to stop people from stealing the products that we make. In recent weeks, you've heard a lot of spurious arguments about this legislation. They've been chronicled in a number of the opening remarks, that it violates the First Amendment, that it under, undermines existing content protection law, that it somehow stifles innovation, and that it will, yes, break the Internet. The irony, of course, of that argument is that I believe it was first heard it was first raised by those opposing the DMCA many years ago, as the chairman will recall, and I believe some of those same people are here today opposing this bill because they think it will undermine the DMCA. So there's a bit of irony there which seems to be lost inside the Beltway, but I suspect that outside the Beltway people see it for what it is. These, these allegations that you're hearing are simply taken from the playbook of those people who have consistently opposed every effort that the Congress has come forward with in the last few years to protect intellectual property. The good news is, is that every time Congress protects intellectual property, the Internet flourishes. Every time the United States stands up for legitimacy over illegitimacy, the Internet gets bigger and stronger. More things are available to consumers. More products are available to consumers. We make more movies. They see more television. Protecting legitimacy is a positive thing for the economy and for innovation. And people that tell you otherwise are wrong. They've been wrong when they've been raising these, these arguments for the past two decades, and they're wrong in the context of this bill. 
What you understand so clearly, Mr. Chairman, is that the Stop Online Piracy and the Stop Online Piracy Act reflects this, is that there is a very great difference between the legitimate marketplace and the illicit sites and services that we are talking about. The legitimate market is protected against the threat, when the legitimate market is protected against the threat of online theft, the only people who lose are those that do not work, take no risk, make no investment, instead those are the people that simply try to profit off the hard work of others. We've also heard arguments that Congress should limit its approach to the threat of rogue sites to quote following the money. It's worth noting that whoever usually makes that argument is really saying you should follow someone else's money. If we are in fact going to follow the money, which is something we should do, we should follow all of the money, not just some of it. Piracy is a complex problem that can't be fi fixed in piecemeal solutions, but this bill is an important first step in trying to deal with what is a very real and growing threat. This is fundamentally about jobs and about projecting the jobs that Americans have creating products that are enjoyed all over the world. Ultimately, someone once said that to lead is to choose, and the bill, Mr. Chairman, that you've put before the Congress in this debate is one which provides a number of choices. It's a choice between illegal and illegitimate. It's a choice between a safe, vibrant internet for everyone and a black market internet. It's a, it's a choice between protecting American creativity and jobs or protecting thieves. These are simple choices from our perspective, and with the leadership that's been provided by this committee, we look forward to this process, debating this bill, putting something on the President's desk that both Republicans and Democrats can support, and at the end of the day, will allow these hardworking Americans to keep their job and keep creating the products that the world enjoys. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Ms. Kirkpatrick. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Conyers, and members of the committee. My name is Linda Kirkpatrick, and I am Group Head, Franchise Development Customer Performance Integrity at MasterCard Wide, Worldwide in Purchase, New York. MasterCard commends the committee on its attention to the issue of Internet-based infringement, including the work that went into H.R. 3261 the Stop Online Piracy Act. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here today and look forward to working with you to combat this critical issue. MasterCard's rules and requirements prohibit the use of its system for any illegal purposes, including for the sale of products or services that infringe on intellectual property rights. MasterCard recognizes the important role it plays in combating this issue and has taken a number of steps that demonstrate its commitment to this important cause. These efforts, which are discussed in my written testimony, include publishing the MasterCard anti-piracy policy, which sets out the specific process by which MasterCard and rights holders can work together to identify and prevent the sale of infring infringing products or services. Working with the White House's Office of U.S. Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator in the development of industry best practices to address online infringement and the implementation and maintenance of MasterCard's Business Risk Assessment and Mitigation Program, otherwise known as our brand program. By way of background, MasterCard operates a global payment system that connects over one billion cardholders and millions of merchants worldwide to complete MasterCard-branded payment transactions. MasterCard neither issues payment cards to cardholders, nor does it contract with merchants to accept payment cards. Rather, MasterCard's financial institution customers issue payment cards to cardholders and or contract with merchants to accept the cards. The card issuing customers are known as issuers. Those customers that contract with merchants for card acceptance are commonly called acquirers. Each cardholder's account relationship is with the issuer that issued the card to the cardholder, and each merchant's acceptance relationship is with its acquirer. MasterCard has a long history of working with law enforcement, private stakeholders, its customers, and others to address illegal or otherwise brand damaging activities that may involve the MasterCard payment system or the unauthorized use of our widely recognized family of payment brands. Our commitment to working with rights holders to prevent the MasterCard system from being used to facilitate online infringement is evidenced by our industry-leading anti-piracy policy, which is publicly available on our internet site. In accordance with that policy, MasterCard has established procedures that apply when a law enforcement entity or rights holder brings to MasterCard's attention evidence of alleged infringement. We have established an email address for the submission of such requests and a set of information requirements for such requests, which are largely similar to the information required of rights holders in H.R. 3261. The process we have implemented was developed collaboratively 
through strong working relationships with rights holders and their trade associations and has led to the investigation of thousands of internet sites and the termination of hundreds of rogue merchants. MasterCard has also worked closely with the White House's Office of the U.S. Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator in the development of a best practices document to address online infringement. Development of the best practices document involved input from a wide variety of stakeholders, including numerous representatives from the rights holder community, payment networks, and other parties involved in online commerce. The best practices are designed to assist rights holders in protecting their intellectual property through a voluntary system and in no way diminish the ability of rights holders to take independent action to enforce their intellectual property rights. Our Business Risk Assessment and Mitigation Program, or BRAM program, is another key component of MasterCard's corporate efforts to preserve the integrity of the MasterCard payment system and protect against illegal and brand damaging transactions. More specifically, the BRAM program serves to restrict access to the MasterCard system by merchants whose products and services may pose significant fraud, regulatory, or legal risks. The BRAM program was created to enforce MasterCard rules prohibiting acquirers from engaging in or supporting any merchant activity that is illegal or that may damage the goodwill of MasterCard or reflect negatively on the MasterCard brand. Merchant activities that infringe upon the intellectual property rights of another are expressly covered under the, under the protocols of the BRAM program. MasterCard is fully committed to continuing to address this important issue. As the committee moves forward with legislation, MasterCard believes it is essential to ensure that any obligations imposed on payment systems are capable of being readily implemented through reasonable policies and procedures, and that payment systems be shielded from litigation and liability when acting in accordance with the bill's requirements. In my written testimony, we have offered a few general comments on the bill along those lines that we believe are consistent with the committee's objectives. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kirkpatrick. And Ms. Oyama. Thank you. Um, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Conyers, members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today, not just on behalf of Google, um, but also on behalf of the Co Consumer Electronics Association, CCIA, Net Coalition, TechNet, uh, Tech America, which together represent thousands of companies. Google takes the problem of online piracy and counterfeiting very seriously. We devote our best engineering talent and tens of millions of dollars every year to fight it. In the last year alone, we have spent more than $60 million to weed out bad actors from our ad services. We have shut down nearly 150,000 AdWords accounts, mostly based on our own detection efforts. And so far this year, we've processed 5 million DMCA takedown requests, targeting nearly 5 million items. We are as motivated as anyone to get this right. But the Stop Online Piracy Act is not the right approach. SOPA would undermine the legal, commercial, and cultural architecture that has propelled the extraordinary growth of internet commerce over the past decade, a sector that has grown to $2 trillion in annual US GDP, including $300 billion from online advertising. Virtually every major internet company, from Twitter to Facebook, Yahoo, and eBay, as well as a diverse array of other groups from venture capitalists to librarians to musicians have expressed serious concerns about this bill. Unfortunately, this legislation is overbroad. It undermines the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has for more than a decade struck a balance. The DMCA provides copyright owners with immediate recourse when they discover infringement online, while also giving service providers the certainty that they need to invest in the products on which millions of Americans rely. The bill sweeps in innocent websites that have violated no law. It imposes harsh and arbitrary sanctions without due process. The following example shows how the bill as currently written would work. Imagine a website, um, let's call it Dave's Online Emporium, uh, which enables small businesses to sell clothing and accessories. Uh, more than 99% of the sellers on Dave's Emporium are entirely legitimate, but unbeknownst to Dave, one seller has started selling counterfeit bags um, and t-shirts that, that parody a copyrighted design. Dave's Emporium takes great care to comply with copyright laws, including takedown procedures, including repeat infringement uh, provisions of the DMCA. But under the Stop Online Piracy Act, the entire site could be deemed, quote, dedicated to theft based on the violations of this single seller and the whole business effectively shut down. Just about any private party 
a corporation, a copyright troll, someone with an ax to grind, could send a notice to payment and advertising companies to terminate services to the site without first involving law enforcement or triggering any judicial process. The complaining party has no duty to contact Dave's Emporium directly to resolve the issue before going straight to ads and payment services to terminate his service. If the Emporium fails to respond with a counter notice within five days, Dave's site could effectively be put out of business. Facing these potential risks, Dave might think twice about establishing his online Emporium in the first place. Countless websites of all kinds, commercial, social, personal, could be shuttered or put out of business based on allegations that may or may not be valid. And the resulting cloud of legal uncertainty would threaten new investment, entrepreneurship, and innovation. In a new study of venture capitalists released today, more than 80% said that the safe harbor provisions of digital copyright laws are essential. Weakening those safe harbor provisions would have a, a recession-like impact on new investment. And at the same time, this proposed law imposes new and unclear obligations on internet service providers to take, quote, technically feasible and reasonable measures to block access to sites to remove them from search results, turning these providers into de facto web censors. This won't work. As long as there's money to be made, pushing pirated and counterfeit products, tech-savvy criminals around the world will find ways to sell these products online and ordering ISPs and search engines to disappear websites from the internet will not change this fundamental reality. We urge you instead to target the problem at the source. Shut down illegal foreign sites by cutting off their revenue. We support legislation that builds on the DMCA. Our proposal would empower the Justice Department to target foreign sites that violate current law, and a court could then order advertisers and payment services in which our services would be included to cut off ads and payments to those sites. Google has been working with the committee on such a solution for over six months um, and we will continue to do so. When all is said and done, we must address online piracy effectively in ways that continue to allow the internet to drive this economy and this country forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oyama. Uh, Mr. Almeida. Good morning, Chairman Smith, Ranking Members Conyers, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Paul Almeida. I'm the president of the Department for Professional Employees, a coalition of 22 national unions affiliated with the AFL-CIO. I am honored to speak today on behalf of the 4 million professional and technical people whom our affiliated unions represent. Those people include creators, performers, and craftspeople in arts, entertainment, and media professional and technical people in education, healthcare, and public administration, in aerospace and other manufacturing, in pharmaceuticals, science, engineering, information technology, and in professional sports. The people I represent work in a wide range of occupations and industries. They share a wide range of interests as workers and consumers, as well as ardent defenders of the First Amendment. On their behalf, permit me to commend you and thank you. Their unions unanimously support the Stop Online Piracy Act, as does the entire AFL-CIO. My message is simple. It has three parts. First, strengthening protections for U.S. intellectual property helps American workers, jobs, incomes, and benefits. Second, counterfeit goods endanger workers, both as workers and consumers. Third, there is no inconsistency between protecting free speech and an open internet and safeguarding intellectual property. If the United States allows attacks on intellectual property to go unanswered, it puts good livelihoods at risk. Online access continues to accelerate and expand. It increasingly displaces traditional models for distributing content and thus heightens the potential for digital theft. Estimates of the number of jobs lost to digital theft in arts, entertainment, and media sector alone run in the hundreds of thousands. Losses of income arise because entertainment professionals depend on compensation at two points. First, when the professionals do the work, and later, when the reuse of the intellectual property. Royalties and residuals 
from downstream revenues enable entertainment professionals to survive between projects. In manufacturing, the estimates of losses from counterfeits also run in the billions. Again, the victims include workers who face lost jobs and income. We should not allow rogue websites to facilitate the distribution of counterfeit goods. My second point, counterfeits endanger workers as workers and as consumers. Only last week, the Senate Committee on Armed Services heard about an astonishing extent of counterfeit electronic parts in the military supply chain. Counterfeits kill. When protective vests are fake, soldiers and police officers can die. When prescription drugs are fake, patients can die. And when smoke detectors are fake, homeowners and firefighters can die. In May, the Atlanta Georgia Fire and Rescue Department recalled roughly 18,500 smoke detectors that it distributed for a free Atlanta smoke alarm program. The smoke detectors were counterfeit and so were the underwriter laboratory seals. An alert from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission noted the unreliable counterfeit alarms pose a life safety hazard to the occupants in the event of a fire. Counterfeit smoke detectors pose a life safety hazard not just to homeowners, but to firefighters. Harold Schaeberger, general president of the International Association of Firefighters, another union affiliated with DPE, wrote to Chairman Smith and Ranking Members Conyers to support the Stop Online Piracy Act. President Schaeberger noted that the preparedness and safety of our members depends on reliable equipment. A blog called techdirt.com posted a defamatory response. Who does the MPAA actually think it's fooling? Is Congress so stupid that it can't figure out for itself that firefighters have no clue what the debate is about? The blog accused firefighters of supporting censorship. It implied the only reason the firefighters spoke up was because the MPA was paying the, off the union. Firefighters know the consequences of counterfeit equipment. My third point, freedom of speech is not the same as lawlessness on the internet. Protecting intellectual property is not the same as censorship. The First Amendment does not protect stealing goods off trucks. I mentioned earlier that the people whom I represent today include ardent defenders of the First Amendment, Amendment, newspaper and broadcast journalists, radio broadcasters, news writers, script writers, and many others in the arts and entertainment and media. When they oppose wage theft, there is no inconsistency with the First Amendment. <coughs> Digital theft and rogue websites diminishes incentives to invest and leads to a downward spiral for U.S. workers in our economy. That's the bad news. The good news is that you are taking action. The professional and technical workers and their unions whom I represent look forward to your passing the Stop Online Piracy Act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Almeida. Um, I'll recognize myself for questions, and Ms. Palante, let me direct a couple questions to you. Uh, in your prepared uh, written statement, uh, you said, quote, if Congress does nothing to provide serious responses to online piracy, the U.S. copyright system will ultimately fail, end quote. Uh, what did you mean by that? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, I don't think that's an overstatement. The system that we have for copyright and have had since 1790 is based on a system of exclusive rights, which authors can license and which publishers and producers can invest in and then distribute and otherwise bring to life for consumers, not only here, but through reciprocal agreements with foreign countries. If those exclusive rights cannot be meaningfully enforced and can be usurped in a lawless environment, they will become uh, meaningless. And if Congress does not update the piracy laws, as it has done for consistently for many, many years, many decades, right. hundreds I, of years. I think you just anticipated my next question, which was going to be, do you think the legal system has all the tools it needs now uh, to combat the infringing websites? I don't. I think that this is a timely hearing. I think uh, Congress has done an excellent job of intervening when technology outpaces the law. It did that in the NET Act. It did that in the ART Act, and I think that this is similar legislation. We're looking at a situation where very sophisticated and very smart and very blatant infringers uh, will leap to offshore locations 
so that they can direct infringing goods, which often belong to our companies, back to American consumers. They're outside the jurisdiction of our courts. We're not suggesting that we would intervene in domestic courts in foreign countries. What we are saying is that we should have some response to allowing them to do that with impunity. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pallante. Uh, Ms. Oyama, let me direct a couple questions to you. Um, and first, let me say that you spoke a lot of the right words today. Uh, we've heard those words before, and I only hope that your company and other, simpler, other similar companies uh, will practice what you preached, and uh, that we will wait to see. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, you do acknowledge that there is a severe problem, I gather, uh, with the theft of intellectual property by foreign criminals. That's a problem that we take uh, extremely seriously. We have hundreds of employees that work on and it. And I believe you agree that if we cut off access to American consumers and U.S. dollars, that that will decrease the amount of intellectual property theft as well. We think cutting off the money is a very effective uh, solution. Okay. Um, the sites are in business because they profit. Okay. Now, in particularly in regard to Google, do you think Google should stop returning search results for foreign sites that are breaking U.S. law? Under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, a rights holder could come directly yeah. to Google, does, would not need to go to court, and they could alert us of the foreign infringement. Well, um, I, and we would a, remove a that lot of search. people don't think the DMCA is sufficient, including the Registrar of Copyrights. Uh, do you think we should go beyond that to try to stop returning the search results for foreign sites? Um, Thank you for the question. I think uh, there's a lot of misperception about what is and no, what is No, no. I was asking a specific question here. Should Google stop returning search results for foreign sites that are breaking U.S. law? We do when notified by rights holders. We've done that more than five so million the, times. So the answer is yes then? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Another question is this. Uh, should Google stop placing ads on illegal sites that are stealing American intellectual property? Our policies prohibit that. Um, we've proactively ejected more than 12,000 sites this year. Okay, and so you would agree not to either facilitate nor place ads on illegal sites that are stealing U.S. property? If a site is violating the law, we would eject them from our system, and we do that. Okay. Again, I hope you can practice what you preach today. That would be a major, a major breakthrough. Uh, it seems to me, and let me just conclude in this way, uh, that Google and other companies really have a decision to make, and I hope they will make the right decision. I hope they will decide to help other American companies. It's not necessarily going to benefit Google or some of your allies, um, but I hope you will decide to help American companies protect their intellectual property uh, from being infringed by uh, foreign criminals. And that is, I know, a decision that you all are having to make and weigh. Uh, I acknowledge and regret to a large extent that if you make the right decision, that is going to mean you're going to have to give up some of the revenue you might get from some of those ads that are actually on the infringing websites themselves. Uh, that's a, uh, a decision for you all to make, but I think you can make the right one there. Uh, I simply hope that you and others will decide to do what's good for, American, for other American companies, uh, do what's good for American jobs, and do what's good for the American economy as well. But thank you for your testimony. Uh, the, gentleman from, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Berman, is recognized for Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and <clears throat> Ranking Member Conyers. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Chairman for responding to my letter and inviting Google to testify. I think it's extremely important to under, understand what legitimate issues the opposition may have so they can be addressed. Um, I haven't heard concrete changes they would recommend. I haven't received a Google proposal or suggested proposal on uh, focusing on foreign rogue websites and would love to see it since it's apparently been discussed with the committee. Uh, opponents of the legislation say we support the bill's stated goals and ask that sponsors consider more targeted ways to combat foreign rogue websites. That's the response to every idea put forward to stop theft. Why isn't this the time for the tech community to put forward concrete and specific proposals that will effectively combat the theft that takes place on the internet. 
the rhetoric around this bill is over the top. None of the sponsors of this bill are against the First Amendment. None of, none of the sponsors of this bill want to shut down the internet. And none of the sponsors want to stymie technology. Perhaps the first example that I'll focus on is opponents claiming that the legislation will undermine U.S. foreign policy and encourage repression by foreign governments. I wrote Secretary Clinton and asked her opinion. She clearly, forcefully, she clearly and forcefully said, there is no contradiction between intellectual property rights protection and enforcement ensuring freedom of expression on the internet. In other words, we can adopt legislation like H.R. 3261 to better protect U.S. intellectual property online at the same time demand that foreign governments respect internet freedom. And I'd like to submit those, record, those letters for the record. Now, with that objection. Um, I'm going to, based on your answers to uh, Mr. Smith's question, I'd like to, to follow up. I thought I heard you say in response to the chairman's question that Google does not link to pirate websites? Under the DMCA procedures that Congress set out, um, a rights holder can notify Google about foreign oh. infringement and we would remove that. All right, well explain to me this one. The Pirate Bay is a notorious pirate site, a fact that its founders proudly proclaim in the name of the site itself. In fact, the site's operators have been criminally convicted in Europe. One has apparently fled to Cambodia. It is being blocked by court order in at least Italy, Denmark, Belgium, Ireland, and Finland. And yet Google continues to send U.S. customers, or at least I don't know what you're doing this morning, but, but before this morning, because um, maybe you can read my mind, uh, U.S. Google continues to send U.S. consumers to the site by linking to the site in your search results. Why do you do this, requiring copyright owners to send thousands upon thousands of, notice, of notices for individual torrent links to the Pirate Bay, only to have those same files reappear on the system when Google crawls the Pirate Bay again? When we all know that this is a nor notoriously egregious pirate site. Why does Google refuse to de-index the site in your search results? Um, copyright, infringement, counterfeiting, these are issues that we take incredibly seriously. Uh, we invest tens of millions of dollars into the problem. We have hundreds of people around the world that work on it. When it comes to copyright... Why does Google refuse to de-index the site in your search results? We will immediately, if we're notified by a rights holder, we would remove the link from our search result to the Pirate Bay. We've done that over five million times this year. When it uh, comes to copyright... You, you, you remove the link to a particular item. Exactly. Why don't you refuse to de-index the site in your search results? The procedures that Congress set out under the DMCA ensure that um, today with websites... Would it make sense to have a law that allowed you, if, that's, if the DMCA doesn't go far enough, a law that essentially told you that's what you should do in response to dealing with a clearly established rogue website that, that flaunts it in every possible way? So we have no idea of knowing if a given search result um, is infringing or is authorized. We do need the cooperation of the rights holder to let us know, and today we are removing links. We think in terms of a legislative approach, something that goes after the real incentive for those sites to be in business makes sense. So enhancing the DMCA and going after advertising, which is our services and payment providers, we think makes sense. Could, we think that could, you, DMCA, could you draft some proposals that reflect that position oh. so we could look at them? I mean, I would love it if you and this, uh, the Consumer Electronics Association and, 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 uh, and public knowledge in these groups would give us something specific. You think this is, it goes too far, it's too excessive. Give us something specific. Infuse yourself with the notion of you want to stop digital theft. What works? And use your brilliant minds that you have in your organizations to give us some specifics because the DMCA is not doing the job. That's so obvious. We are, we are very interested in working with your staff, with the chairman and other members of the committee. Um, I do believe through NET Coalition we have provided that language and we'd be happy to, to follow up. Um, we do think in terms of search results, the Congress got it right under the DMCA. It leaves up 
legitimate content, it takes down infringing content. We want to make sure that when we're dealing with speech that we use a scalpel. Well, I, my, my time has expired, but you cannot look at what is going on since the passage of the DMCA and say, Congress got it just right. We agree. Maintain the status quo. We, we Jim, Jim's time has expired. Would be useful. Thank you, Mr. Berman. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to have you all with us. I've, I've had to miss some of the hearing, Mr. Chairman, because of other meetings, but it's good to be here. I was going to examine Ms. Polanti, but the chairman beat me to it. I was going to examine Ms. Oyama, but Mr. Berman beat me to it, but I'll, I'll still try to recover. Ms. Obama, let me ask you this, Ms. Oyama. What relief does the DMCA offer to a trademark owner who is trying to prevent counterfeiters from selling fakes? Um, so for counterfeit, it's dealt with a little bit differently. Um, for counterfeit at Google, uh, we will um, act through our for our ad advertising. Um, we've ejected, so for example, for AdWords, we've ejected over 100,000 accounts in the last year. Um, there's uh, a very kind of stark difference between copyright and trademark. Um, Congress so far has not enacted a DMCA for trademark. Um, copyright laws are exclusive rights. Trademarks, it depends on what geography you're in, right? What um, product you can use. This uh, given name, Pacific, can be used on lots of different products. And so I know there's been kind of a long-standing conversation um, about, ab about that issue. Um, certainly, if we ever were to receive a court order um, about counterfeit and related to search, well, of course, we would comply with that court order. I thank you. Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, how involved or organized criminal networks in the, the manufacture and distribution of counterfeit medicines? From my estimation and experience, it's, it's um, a problem that's growing. Um, I don't think we've reached the level yet where um, we, we are seeing global cartels per se, as we do in narcotics. Um, but as the notoriety of the crime gets around, um, the profit margins are so phenomenal and the penalties on a global scale are so low um, that it's a no-brainer for, for organized crime to, to look at this as a, a, a way to go. So it is growing. We've seen instances of it, not systemic instances, but we have seen, as I decided, the Detroit instance where money was going to Hezbollah. We have seen drug traffickers, um, but I think it's, it's growing in that capacity. Mr. Clark, what aspects of SOPA do you believe are particularly important to combating the problem of counterfeiting medicines? I apologize, Congressman, I, I missed the first part of that. Uh, what aspects of SOPA, the bill before us, that do you believe are particularly important to combating the problem of counterfeiting medicines? I think all aspects. Uh, my biggest worry, Congressman, is that um, counterfeit medicines are still not perceived by the public, um, by law enforcement, by judiciary, um, our, our, our judges and, and prosecutors as a serious crime yet. Um, when you see somebody like Kevin Zhu, um, who has a, a global reputation for supplying counterfeits, it was my understanding during his undercover um, discussions, he offered a list of counterfeit medicines. Um, and yet he said, if anything is on that list, anything else off that list that you want, I can have it for you and give me two weeks. We're talking cancer medicines. We're talking blood pressure medicines. We're talking Alzheimer medicines. Um, and I think when we see a few tablets here or there, we have a tendency not to think of the consequences those tablets bring. A lot of people in the United States, I think, look at it and say, there's no bodies in the street. Nobody seems to be dying from counterfeits. So it, it can't be that serious of a crime. I got you. But when you look at people, if, at best, if they're getting 20% of the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the medicines that they're taking, such as this Alzheimer medicines that was manufactured in Turkey, um, manufactured in facilities such as this, where there are no conditions that, in terms of licensing, regulatory, environmental, are applied, um, even with just 20% of the, the active ingredient, what's the other 80%? And if there's nothing but benign chemicals in that 80 percent, they're still not going to get relieved of their disease and they eventually die. So my biggest worry, Congressman, is that people are dying from these counterfeits. We just haven't figured out a way to correlate the you. deaths from counterfeits 
with with the problem yet. I thank you. I want to beat I want to beat that red light that will illuminate eminently, and say to Ms. Kirkpatrick, I have advised that Mastercard has been instrumental in in combating piracy, and Mr. Chairman, I think it should be noted for those who who have combated, particularly flagrant piracy, that that should be noted. And I thank you all for being with us, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Coble. Uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Watts, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and let me start by thanking all of the witnesses for being here today. Um, uh, this is a difficult issue. Um, uh, this legislation raises some interesting uh, new challenges, uh, but the uh, circumstances uh, are raising difficult new challenges. Um, uh, Ms. Oyama, um, let, me, let me start um, with you because I want to be sure I understood your testimony. Um, I got the impression that uh, you ha do not object strenuously to the provisions of Section 102 uh, because they require a court order uh, that your primary objections are with respect to the provisions in 103 where private um, market-based system to protect customers are involved because they don't get it doesn't require giving notice to the site owner or whoever's put up the site am I misstating where you are on that um, we would certainly agree the concerns about 103 are um, the greatest. One, because of the scope of what's well, let me let me Let me separate the question. Uh, do you have concerns with Section 102? We would be, uh, the legislation we support. The question um, is, do you have concerns with Section with 102? With some of the remedies, yes. Um, the, some of the remedies, okay. The DNS and you'll, and you'll give us that in writing. Uh, uh, so that we can evaluate those concerns. Yeah, the ads. Uh, but the your ads primary the concerns are with Section 103. Is that? I think if I we got that? if we got the remedies right in 102, focused on ads and payments, the way that these sites are making money. I, I didn't. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not trying to get you to resolve that issue about 102 today. I, I'm I'm. I'd rather have that in writing. It's much more workable. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, but your concerns about 103 have to do with the lack of notice to the to the site owner, right? Yeah, in part, I think. Uh, the okay, so do, is there some effective way that we could give uh, notice to the site owner that you are aware of? And if you could give me those suggestions in writing, because um, I have those concerns too. Um, the problem is we don't we don't currently have any effective way. Uh, access to those uh, to that information to give them notice um, and you do um, I think uh, in your system because you you put up the you put up the site okay uh, now if you can help me with those two things we'll be far down the road I'm not adverse to uh, to addressing your concerns I've, I've indicated to that you um, to you both in private and and I'm saying it publicly today. Uh, let me talk about this constitutional standard that, um, uh, and make sure that I understand where you are on that. Um, because you appear to be advocating a constitutional standard uh, that would prohibit the enforcement of any laws online. Um, in your written testimony, you disagree with um, Professor Abrams' conclusion that it is constitutional to block access to a website that is primarily infringing, even though such blocking may incidentally Im impact protected speech. Your written testimony won't concede that blocking a website that is almost <coughs> entirely infringing would be, cons uh, would be uh, constitutional. Uh, and you've confirmed that in what you've just said uh, um, verbally here. Does that mean that you consider it unconstitutional for law enforcement to seize a child pornography site if the site also contains one copy of the King James Bible? 
So the speech concerns that have been raised. Um, I, I, I just answer that question for me, and uh, then I'll, I'll go forward from there. They're certainly um, legitimate. What, uh, what about if it contains 20 copies of the King James now, but it's still 90% um, child pornography? Are you saying First Amendment rights won't allow uh, us to do that? I think we agree with Floyd Abrams that you need to look at the whole site. You need to make sure that it's really dedicated to infringement. And okay, well, uh, legitimate and, and, speech, and it does probable calls would, would, uh, would require the Attorney General's office to do that. I mean, he's not going to go and, uh, and, and cite you un unless uh, or start this process unless he's gone through that analysis. Uh, the question is, do you think that there's something unconstitutional about taking down a site that is overwhelmingly, primarily devoted to uh, to um, uh, to stolen products. Um, and and I, you know, if if that's if that's your position, I think we're going to have a real problem with that. No, I think uh, if if there was a, a site out there that was a hundred percent terrible, um, that's a separate issue. No, I'm saying 90% terrible. I'm saying 98% terrible. Is it is 2% going to save the site from being taken down? I, I don't think there's an exact number. I think when you are sweeping in vast majorities of legitimate speech um, without notice, that raises significant. Is that 51% or is it 60%? Uh, or uh, I mean, how how are we going to do this? You're you're telling me I can't violate somebody's constitutional rights if it incidentally adversely impacts their, um, their um, protected rights. That's what you're saying. No, I, I think if a, if a site was primarily dedicated to infringement, there's a lot of tools that launch. Okay, well, that's what the bill says, isn't it? Well, we would not agree that the scope of the definition <laughs> captures uh, totally infringing sites. We have a lot of concerns that it sweeps in legitimate. No, I didn't say totally infringing. That's not what you said either. Um, that's not what you said. You said primarily infringing. And, and then all of a sudden you shift it over to totally infringing. Is this a question about whether something is totally infringing or primarily infringing? Or do you, uh, you think that both of them, uh, 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 that one should be protected and one should not be protected? I think a definition that was... Um you know, narrowly drawn that had something like primarily would okay, be Okay, so you're going to give us some language on that. Yeah. Yep. My okay. time is up. We have a definitional. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, thank you, Mr. Watt. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatt, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Oyama, I want to uh, pursue that <laughs> line of questioning. Um, uh, years ago, uh, former Chairman Henry Hyde put me in a room with about 30 government representatives uh, from the content industry, from the uh, online industry, internet service providers, and a few uh, that had a foot in both camps. And we worked for months in a, in a hot room and uh, uh, came to agreement on the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and in particular, the notice and takedown provisions, which you have spoken highly of. And I, I agree with you that those provisions still have uh, a role uh, in uh, protecting uh, online copyright. But the Internet has changed dramatically since then. The speeds uh, have accelerated. The technology is more sophisticated. Search engines are more sophisticated. Uh, and the criminals who use all of that uh, uh, to rip off uh, legitimate businesses of all kinds are more sophisticated. So as you know and as I've said, I'm interested in making sure that this legislation gives effective tools to combat lawbreakers but to also ensure it does not entangle legitimate online businesses or the ability of entrepreneurs to continue to bring exciting new products and services uh, to the Internet. Can you tell the committee the top concerns the tech community has about the bill and your specific recommendations on how to fix those concerns within the bill? Sure, thank you. Um, I think when the conversation started, the idea was to target foreign rogue sites, sites that were clearly breaking the law, and to introduce, build on the DMCA, introduce new harsh remedies. That is definitely an approach that we would get behind, that we would support. I think when the tech community now is looking at this language, there are serious concerns that um, 
the definition of a site that's dedicated to the theft of U.S. property, you know, probably purely unintentionally, it sweeps in a great amount of lawful websites. So, um, for example, the unit of analysis for what, um, what, what the site is, there's some language in there that says an internet site or a portion thereof. So there's some concern about whether we're looking at the whole site or are we just looking at one blog, one tweet, one comment, one page on a site. So, so getting the definition right would be really important. Um, there's other words within the definition that seem to introduce notions like facilitate. That's uh, one of the reasons why the Consumer Electronics Association, who I mentioned, they have serious concerns um, because they manufacture so many different devices. Somebody could say that the internet itself facilitates infringement. So we need to make sure that we're really, we're really staying within the existing confines of copyright law. Um, I would also mention in the definition, there's some language, you can be dedicated to theft if you have, no one understands, um, sir, what this means. If you have taken deliberate actions to avoid confirming a high probability of the use of your site for infringement. Um, right now, small business owners, when they're starting a website, they know if they comply with the DMCA, they are lawful companies. They can seek investment, they can go forward. If they have to um, somehow subscribe to that kind of definition, the folks that we're hearing from, they just have no idea how they would even possibly build their site to fit that definition. So I think getting, getting the scope of what is a site dedicated to infringement would be critical. And from there, we're certainly more than happy to work on remedies. The two that we think are really smart, um, if you look at WikiLeaks, I think this is a good example of, of the fact that this is a strong remedy, is choking these sites off at their revenue source. They are in business because they can either sell advertising or because they can profit from subscribers. If you could get the entire industry together and you could choke off advertising and you could choke off payments to those sites, you would be incredibly effective without introducing the collateral damage that we had discussed um, to free speech or to internet architecture, things like that. Um, so ensuring that we had the right remedies um, and the right scope, I think there's plenty of opportunity um, for all, all players, um, for a cross-section of industry to come together. Let me, let me just follow up on that. Uh, the more detailed information you give us, the better our ability to address legitimate concerns. So will you commit to working with me to identify the specific problems that the tech community has with the bill and working to address those specific problems to improve the bill as we move Absolutely. forward. Absolutely. And some have argued that this legislation would break the Internet. Uh, as the co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus, that's the last thing I want to do. Can you explain exactly how this legislation would impact the functioning of the Internet? So I think, um, I think the major concerns that have been raised um, really kind of in the cybersecurity field, so there's a white paper by a group of engineers um, who designed um, DNSSEC. Um, there's some other leading cybersecurity uh, folks who have spoken out about it. I think, I think Stuart Baker has been on record. Um, he's a former senior official at DHS and the former general counsel of the NSA. One of the um, provisions in the bill would require ISPs to perform um, DNS blocking. There's um, kind of a twofold concern there. One is that, um, that the, the methods proposed here um, are not compatible with uh, a more than 10 year long effort in the cybersecurity field to implement DNSSEC in a way that would prevent cybersecurity attacks. Um, so I am not the cybersecurity expert, the, but the folks that, that wrote that code are saying that this will really harm the US and the global effort to make DNS more secure. Um, I think the second piece is uh, we know that users unfortunately are seeking this material. We can predict that there are gonna be circumvention efforts um, and so there's a big concern that if we place certain obligations on U.S. DNS providers, no. um, that users are going to reroute their traffic to offshore rogue providers. And the vulnerabilities that an offshore rogue provider could introduce into the network, not, not just for the kid that's looking for the movie or for some bad actor, but for anyone um, whose network that they're on is really significant. It could introduce spyware, malware, privacy concerns. Um, I know this is you know something that really the folks who are the experts in this field have raised, um, but you know, that's been kind of a critical concern about. Ms. Ziyama, I hate to interrupt, but I, I, I do believe that Mr. Clark, if the chairman will permit, Mr. Clark from his past experience with the Department of Justice might also be able to comment on this issue. If Mr. Clark, could you give a very brief response? 
very briefly, I, I, unfortunately I don't have the cyber experience. It wasn't one of the areas I, I actually worked myself. We, I've managed it. I don't know the intricacies about it, though, in all honesty, so I apologize for not having an answer for that. Well, I, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I thought, <laughs> thought there was an opportunity there, but perhaps not. Ms. Oyama, thank you. We look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Goodlatte. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren, is recognized. Before um, my questions, I would like to ask unanimous consent to introduce uh, a number of items into the record uh, uh, opposition to the provisions of the bill. The letters are from the Consumer Union and other consumer groups, TechNet, Tech America, the American Library Association, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, Human Rights Watch, other public interest groups, dozens of human rights groups around the world, a written statement from the ACLU, a paper from the Brookings Institute explaining how the bill would undermine security and stability of the Internet, a white paper by five leading DNS engineers and Internet uh, security experts, a letter from the anti-phishing working group, an article from Stuart Baker, uh, the former general counsel of the NSA and policy chief for DHS under the Bush administration, entitled Copyright Bills Could Kill Hopes for Secure Net, a letter signed by AOL, eBay, Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, LinkedIn, Google, Mozilla and Zynga, and a Harvard Business Review uh, article entitled Great Firewall of America. Without objection. You know, I think uh, some today have sort of written off, I think, serious criticisms of this bill as hyperbole and that uh, the only objection is about money and hyperbole, and I just don't think that's the case. Uh, the big tech companies weren't the ones who said this bill would cause the U.S to lose its position as a global leader in supporting a free and open Internet. That's from dozens of human rights groups around the world. The big tech companies weren't the ones who wrote the, that the bill has the potential to do consumers more harm than good. That's from the consumers union and other nonprofit consumer groups. The big tech companies didn't write that the bill is in conflict for, with the First Amendment. That's from the ACLU and over 100 uh, law uh, professors. It wasn't the big tech companies who said the bill kill our best hope for securing the Internet. No, that's from Stuart Baker, the former assistant secretary for DHS and the former general counsel of the National Security Agency. Dozens of venture capitalists, not big tech companies, wrote that the bill will stifle investment in Internet services, throttle innovation, and hurt American competitiveness. And it hasn't generally been. Uh, the policy of this committee to dismiss, dismiss the views of those in industries that we're going to regulate. And these are just a few of the examples. Now, I understand why co-sponsors of the legislation are not happy about widespread criticism of the bill. But I think impugning the motives of the critics rather than engaging in the substance is a mistake. Uh, I I'd, I'd have a number of questions, and I note that um, you know, we've got six witnesses here, five are in favor and only one is against, and that troubles me, I'll just say that. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a balanced effort, and I'm sorry that we don't have any technical expertise on this panel in terms of engineering talent, um, because I think that is an important issue as to the DNS blocking portions of the bill. So let me ask a question of Mr. O'Leary. Do you believe that software programs should be illegal if they allow a user to circumvent Internet filtering ordered by the government? I don't believe that software programs should be per se illegal. I think if people misuse them, then they should be. If they misuse any product in violation of the law, they should suffer. So, so the ability to just simply circumvent the takedown order as a software add-on to a browser should continue to be a legal uh, Well, no, if you're saying you're thing. building something in specifically to avoid an order of the court not to do something, I do have a problem with that. So you think that software ought to be illegal? <laughs> well, that's not what I said, no. Well, it's one or the other. Either you should be able to do that or, or you shouldn't be able to do it. Which is it? <clears throat> Does the software have a legitimate purpose or is it simply to circumvent a court order? Well, circumventing software can be a, multi a multiplicity of use. We, for right, example, but in your question, you said the software would, allow, would be created to allow circumvention. There is a, there's an add-on to Firefox that will allow 
uh, circum... I think that most legitimate companies in the United States, including Firefox, should abide by court orders and follow the law. So, well, you're not really answering the question. I will take from you, you think that that ought to be regulated at least. Regulated? In much the same way that we regulate uh, people driving drunk and stealing things. Yeah, I think that... I know that the word regulation let me, has... Let me ask you this, because I don't have a long time, and I assume that you were directing your comments that people didn't care that Northern California people didn't care about jobs in the rest of America, either to myself or Mr. Lundgren, since we're the only members of the committee from Northern California, I will say I do care about jobs all over America. And in fact, eBay, which is headquartered in San Jose, has enabled thousands of Americans all over the country to form small businesses and to use uh, the internet to sell uh, products. I'd like to know, um, your concept of, you think that this is a big problem, and I think it's a problem. I think it's that internet piracy is something that is troubling, it's illegal, and I think we need to do something about it. So let me just put that out there. How many um, sites do you think need to be shut down in order to say we've succeeded in the fight against internet privacy? Is it a dozen? Is it hundreds? Is it thousands? Do you have any idea the scope of the number of sites that need to be removed? Well, I think, first of all, you mischaracterized my comment about Northern, Northern California, and I'd like to correct the record on that. I was simply... I'll do it later, because I don't have that much time. Answer my question. Actually, the gentlewoman's time has expired, but you're free to answer the question. Thank you. Uh, the comment about Northern California was, in the context of this debate, the perception has been created by opponents of this bill that all of the innovation and all of the creative thinking comes out of, out of Silicon Valley. I was not taking umbrage with anyone in Silicon Valley. We have great relationships with a lot of people in Silicon Valley. Pixar, which makes wonderful movies, is in Silicon Valley. Apple, which is a legitimate online retailer, is in Silicon Valley. But I was also making the simple point, Congresswoman, that there are people all over this country in places like Detroit, Baltimore, Texas, North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, I wonder since... Um I'm, I'm happy to answer your question. May I have an additional 30 seconds? Uh, will the gentleman answer the question very briefly? How many sites? Well, I know for a fact that we could start with Pirate Bay, which was mentioned earlier. I do not know how many So is it just Pirate are. Bay, do you think? Or is it no. a dozen? Is it a thousand? What do you think? It would be easier to answer the question if, if I was allowed to. Um, there are multiple sites out there. This is a legitimate problem. We have been very clear, and we will continue to be clear, that there is no silver bullet. The problem is evolving and changing. I cannot sit here right now and tell you in good faith that I know what that number is. But what I do know is that there are literally hundreds of sites out there that are engaging in this activity. So you think and it's in the neighborhood? You know that, the gentleman is time. know that is to go to Google and type in J. Edgar. And you will get a list of page or Baidu after page or after Bing page or any of, them. of sites that are engaging in this illegal activity. So, you, so it's hundreds the, or thousands. The, the, the gentleman's time has expired, but let me remind members that they're welcome to submit written questions to any of the panelists, and we'll uh, try to get those answers to the members as quickly as we can. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Ice, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the gentlelady from the North, while I am deep in the Confederacy of California, uh, went through quite a litany of, of good opponents to the bill. I'd like to add to that by unanimous consent the following, a joint letter by 160 entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs and executives, a letter expressing concern about SOPA from the Digital Media Association, a statement by the Consumer Electronics uh, Association, Electronic Association, which was denied an opportunity to be here as a witness, a letter signed by 53 venture capitalists expressing concern regarding the, the uh, PROTECT Act, and a transcript of recent remarks made by Vice President Joe Biden that he gave in, at the London Cybersecurity Conference germane to his concerns about this bill. Uh, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been the victim of piracy, so you're not going to have a problem with me agreeing with the problem. Hardware, software, got it all. But, Mr. Clark, I'm going to hope that you can stretch for this part of it, even though it's not in your title. You're familiar with the ITC, aren't you? Yes, I am. Pfizer regularly, for patent infringement on imported products, would go to the ITC and get relatively quick justice using administrative law judges available to them and injunctive relief against a patent violator, correct? Outside of my field, but I would believe that would be the case. So 
when we deal with rogue elements outside the jurisdiction of the United States that are importing in the United States, we have a history uh, of, uh, of, of an organization that is quick, administrative, and can have continued jurisdiction against non-U.S. entities who are, in fact, trying to take what they have stolen and sell it into America. Is that you correct? Correct in your understanding? Generally speaking, yes. Okay, have any of the other of you, but just raise your hands, worked with the ITC in your background or are familiar with them? One other. Well, let me just run through quickly because time will be very limited and questions seem to be, the answer seems to be long. We have a court of jurisdiction. Now, they do not specifically have the mandate to follow the money and to provide injunctive relief against Google, eBay, or anybody else after they find an offshore infringer and seek remedies. They have their own consuls, they have administrative law judges, they have a procedure. Mr. Chairman, I object to this, this bill in its current form, mostly because I believe it fails to use tools that are generally better than the tools that we have at our disposal in this bill. And I believe that if the real remedy sought is, in fact, a court of continued jurisdiction specializing in intellectual property and designed to, in fact, reach a quick solution to a question of whether there is wrongdoing and then follow the money through injunction, not through fines, and obviously a criminal referral. My intention is to offer legislation on a bipartisan basis that will in fact look at the legitimate concerns, take a great deal of these 80 pages. However, and this is where it's tough, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, suggest that a, a jurisdiction not within this committee get a substantial portion of this bill because I believe that that is as appropriate as it is for the federal courts to consider domestic entities who are violating it. And so with that, uh, Ms. Ayama, if I'm pronouncing it right, yes. has, in your experience, has Google worked with uh, the ITC or any other uh, administrative law judges in, in, in executing on other people's uh, judgments? Mm -hmm. I would imagine in the patent context, yes, it's not my field, so I can't speak to it. Okay. Personally. But do you agree that, that having a court of continued jurisdiction that, in fact, can work for injunctive relief as technology is available is generally something that, that Google and the other search engines would see as, as reasonable once there is a judgment entered against uh, an offender somewhere? Yeah, I think we'd be happy to work on that type of solution. And I'm going to get to the others, but Mr. Clark... Uh, if you had that and you had a judgment against party A who had an internet site and then 25 other similar parties show up from the same country and have all the identities uh, that, that tell you it's basically the same group you already have a judgment against, wouldn't you benefit from having a court that we specifically gave jurisdiction to to determine quickly that those are alter egos and execute upon them so that you wouldn't go through this whack a mo again and again trying to prove to somebody that it's basically the same people doing it again? My working relationship with the ITC has been very, very limited. I'm not, I'm not quite certain what their capabilities are. If you're saying you're going to empower them to do certain work like that, it would make some sense. Um, Cur currently, they are the, uh, and the others will probably know this, this, that's a place that plaintiffs go to if there's any importation and they have a patent because they can administer a decision faster than the fastest rocket, fastest rocket do docket. And unlike the eBay decision, they have injunctive relief not only as a tool, but as their one and only tool, and they use it without discretion because, in fact, that is the mandate of Congress. But you were still talking of a referral process, I think, to DOJ then for a criminal follow-up and for asset recovery. Right, and, and I, re I recognize at some point the administrative law judges look and say, we have a domestic entity that is not complying with our injunctions or, or a, a site that is just as rogue in the U.S. So I'm, I'm very aware that there are elements here that if you are cooperating or facilitating with uh, a foreign entity that there would have to be a referral. That's not going to be Yahoo or Google or eBay. It's going to be, as you know, the rogue sites you fight every day. Right, and I would just be worried about the bifurcation of activity and, and then the referral process and the elongation of, of, of the, the end result if, if something like that were arranged. Well, I look forward to showing uh, both our witnesses and the committee that, in fact, the ITC's time to uh, uh, judgment and their execution is actually much shorter than our federal courts and less discretionary 
than the Justice Department generally. And I thank the gentleman, uh, the chairman, for his indulgence and yeah. yield back. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson, Lee, recognized. Let me thank the uh, gentleman, uh, chairman, very much, and the ranking member. And uh, let me call the roll and uh, for the record and say that I want the U.S. Library of Congress, I want Pfizer, uh, the Motion Picture Association of America, MasterCard, uh, Google, and our good friends uh, in the technical uh, aspect of our movie making business and all supporters to be made whole. Uh, I think we have a consensus that online uh, piracy is um, uh, a um, both devastating uh, and destructive element of the nation's economy. In fact, I have said, I think, I believe often uh, that it steals the genius of this country. Uh, we are very proud of the motion picture industry and uh, uh, I am, um, if you will, uh, cup runneth over. I may be your physical armor uh, when I see the massive thievery that goes on and certainly in some of our international friends. So I start off with that and um, I, I want to find a, a common ground uh, and as I have uh, looked uh, at the legislation, I hope the chairman and, and ranking member will give us the time to really study the legislation. Several things come to mind. Uh, one, uh, this legislation uh, has no referral. I'm a member of the Homeland Security Committee, uh, and um, our committee spent years helping to build the switch to the DNSSEC. And um, if this bill would pass, uh, we would um, have a challenge uh, with that format. And um, the question is, uh, would um, everyone who needs to make changes to the DNSEC uh, would instead be on the phone to their lawyers asking whether they would be sued for adopting security technology that will make the mandated block and redirect system even more difficult? We have to look at all of these issues. So I, I want to um, ask the Library of Congress first if she has any comments regarding uh, that conflict. Uh, we are supposed to be collaborative. Uh, you're the only government witness. I'm not sure if you've thought of that, but let me give you a second question quickly since our time is going quickly. Uh, I am concerned about how this bill will, what effect it will have on small businesses, particularly those that couldn't afford to go to court should a rights holder come forward and demand that their access to revenue be shut off. If a rights holder ac accuses a small business website of being facilitating, of, excuse me, of facilitating infringement and a payment processor shuts off payments to that business, is a payment processor immune from suit under Section 104 and what rights do they have? So first, is there any collaboration or recognition about the system that the DHS has formulated? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer. Don't have that question. Mr. Chairman, I think we have to have that answer from whatever resources we can get. Next if you can have any insight on how it impacts small businesses, yes. uh, this particular legislation. So that section of the bill, I believe, was actually invented to make it easier and quicker and to avoid the court process and the cost. That, that's the goal. Uh, there is no liability for the intermediaries under that section. There's an obligation if it goes to the next mm -hmm. stage and there's a court order. There's an obligation. To right. The so there's says. still a process that a small business might have to be engaged in. But... To, there's still a process. This there, makes there it easier. Is. And, and they are good faith intermediaries, and they have not themselves uh, broken the law, and, and the bill tries to take that into account. If we can refine that, we should. Yes, because they still have an obstacle to climb, if you might. L let me go to Ms. Oyamo. It, excuse me. It, it, forgive us for all not reading the name correctly. I, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, but let me quickly give you a series of questions. Ms. Oyama, is that correct? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, kind of groups that I've been engaged in over the last uh, couple of months uh, is the uh, generation of youth that are excited about startups. They're everywhere. Uh, they are job creators. And I see them as the next nucleus of job creation in America. They are, they are obviously functioning now. Uh, they're all trying to emulate all of the stars of social network. We know that won't be the, the case, but they are trying to create jobs. So let me raise these concerns uh, with you. Um, uh, I think immediately what comes to mind is that this uh, legislation may be overly broad, um, that it uh, too easily circumvents uh, Internet users, uh, and um, it is inherently incompatible with the way Internet actually works. Would you comment on uh, the overbroad, the circumventing Internet users, and um, 
incompatible with the way the internet works. Can you do that quickly for me? And then uh, I'd like to uh, go back uh, to uh, Miss, uh, if you can be listening to this question uh, about um, the um, uh, Miss Palenti, if you have any um, idea um, about um, the problematic aspect of this for small, again, in small and minority businesses. But Miss Oyama. Sure. Um, on the overbreadth concern. Uh, Overbroad. Overbroad. A huge concern is the scope of the definition of what's a site dedicated to theft. Um, so that's a concern that's been raised uh, among small businesses, larger tech companies. If we're going to go after rogue sites, we have to make sure that they're rogue sites and they're breaking the law. Um, there's a lot of concern that right now the definition would cover um, new ground. It would cover sites that today are complying with the DMCA, so they're taking down infringement when they're notified by rights holders. Um, it would be sites that today under existing law, if they were hauled into court, they would be found not guilty under existing copyright law. So I think there's the scope concerns there. Um, circumvented uh, by Internet users. It can be too easily circumvented by Internet users. Yeah, so, so one of the concerns is that um, on the, the notice and terminate provision, um, that piece does not go through a court, and so somebody could just uh, notify a service provider. You could go away for Thanksgiving if you're a, a website owner. Um, your ads and payment providing services under the bill could be shut off in five days. So there's a lot of concern that, um, you know, that doesn't really provide adequate due process um, in terms of the way current businesses work. Um, I would say in terms of the uh, incompatibility with the Internet, um, in the Internet sphere, uh, internet traffic is going to route around blockages and so kind of working with the grain of the internet um, we think is really smart is really effective it's why we support the the legislation we had discussed before about cutting off the funding sources um, it's worked in going after sites like WikiLeaks which is incredibly sophisticated site much of international law enforcement was going after WikiLeaks and if you go to WikiLeaks homepage it says that they are going down because payment providers shut them off. The um, gentlewoman's so time has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Oyama, uh, do you feel that, that this bill is an infringement of, of the First Amendment right of free speech? You know, I think short of the constitutionality, it certainly raises free speech concerns. Is, um, it, is it censorship that you're concerned about? Is that yeah, so uh, the U.S. has had a good platform globally to speak out for free expression. Um, and I think a, a law like this, which would, for the first time, empower the government. Um, and I would empower the government to require you to do something that you don't want to do, which would be to set down a site. Is that correct? We're happy to disable links when we're notified by rights holders. We think that going... And as long as you do it without a third party, such as a government, it's not an infringement of First Amendment rights of free speech, nor is it an, an, a censorship, is it? We don't do full site blockages. We do page by page for a copy. But you do takedowns? Under DMCA, yes. Yes, which is the same thing. I mean, I'm just having a hard time yeah. distinguishing when you do it, it's okay, but when you have a third party, such as the federal government requiring you to do it, then it becomes censorship and infringement of first amendment rights. Um, but under let me the further, government but, approach, it's much broader in this bill. Than let, me, let me go a little bit yeah. further here, because I want to go to your example of Dave's Emporium, uh, which I think is a great example for people such as me that think, think simply to understand a small business. But I want to look at it from a consumer rights perspective. Let's say that Dave's Emporium, because of that 1% vendor that he uses on the internet that's found through your, your, your Google search, results in the purchase of a product that causes death or personal injury. Now, in that chain of commerce, Google would be brought into action, especially where there's joint and several liability as a deep pocket, to defend that suit and probably pay damages. All of that could have been prevented had there been an investigation, had there been the appropriate execution under this act. In fact, not only would it have been prevented, but also under this bill, is there not an affirmative defense that Dave's Emporium could have asserted in the sense that I don't have the, 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 uh, the, the resources to hire a lawyer that would mitigate my responsibility to now have to defend the order to, to, to take down. So what I'm getting at is, is that even further, you have immunities under this act that would prevent a third party suit against you if you shut it down. But you don't have immunities if, in fact, you allow for the sale and purchase of products that are not only counterfeit, but they also result in death or, or personal injury. So on counterfeit, it's definitely something that we agree with you. Counterfeit is a, a big problem. It's something that we invest tons of uh, engineering hours, millions of dollars into going after. Um, 
for example, for, for AdWords, we ejected 95% um, But it would seem to me that you would, you would want to have the immunities. You would want to have some protection, some safe harbors to prevent lawsuits against you in the execution of your, of, of your, of your business. I think if a court is um, instructing intermediaries to take action, there's probably some place for immunities. But the concern here is that uh, Dave could be shut off for five days, not pursuant to his terms of service. Certainly, no one but has But he could be put out of business being sued because of a harmful product. That could have been prevented had Google investigated the site. So certainly no one has an absolute right to ads or payment services. We think that there should well, be... Well, Dave's in a bad situation either way. And I think that he needs to have some protections. And I think that this bill will offer some of that. But let me, let me, let me t shift to another thing. And, and let me tell you, I, I appreciate what Google's done with regard to child pornography. I mean, you guys have stepped up to the plate tremendously. And I think that's a wonderful example. You need to be congratulated for that. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And it would seem to me that following the letter of the law, you could do the same thing in this regard in an effort to hold down or at least eliminate the use of pirated sites by way of the search engine Google. Um, so child pornography is certainly a huge you know, problem. It's something we take very seriously. Technically, going after child pornography in a search engine is completely different from copyright because a machine can detect child pornography. A machine can look for flesh tones. Um, a human, if you look at it, would know what it is and could eject it. And with but it's still with the right copyright, thing to do. you can't just look at a video and know whether it's infringing or licensed, right? It needs to be a collaboration with the rights owner. Real quickly, Ms. Kirkpatrick, not a question, just a thank you on behalf of MasterCard for what you're doing because you're cutting off the source of the problem, and that's very important. Mr. Almeida, yeah. I had a chance to meet a couple of days ago with one of your members, a gentleman who, uh, a lifelong uh, songwriter, he's in this room, and he met with me and he said, you know, the problem isn't that, that, that it's a fight over between the, the movie houses and the producers, it's the small people, the people who have followed their passion, the people who have the artistic ability to do something they've always wanted to do, that now, after 30 years of being a songwriter, has to look at whether he can keep his house, what his future is going to hold. And I wish you would do for me and explain to the members up here is how this adversely impacts not the giants in, in Hollywood and not the giants in Nashville, but those that participate, those whose creativity, creativity and innovation will be stifled unless there's some protections. Well, I think there does need to be protections. And I think that's what this bill hopes to do. The, um, and this isn't to protect the big the big dogs in Hollywood. Right. Our members who are behind the scenes, who are uh, stagehands, who, who are the, the people who build the sets, the back end payments for those workers support their health and pension fund. And that's being cut off. They're adversely being impacted by, by these rogue sites and by the uh, piracy of, of their videos. A video being released today will be available by the weekend on, on the web. And so, we, we're hoping that this legislation will help to take a step forward in that area. Thank you. I see my time's expired. I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ross. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Waters, recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just say that uh, I find the discussion on H.R. 3261 uh, extremely interesting and engaging. And I think Mr. Watt um, framed um, this issue somewhat. Uh, in his opening statement when he talked about the giants um, in competition and the, um, the profits and the money that's involved being at the basis of all of it. Um, and let me just say that I view any proposed changes in IP and copyright law as an opportunity to examine whether changes will expand opportunities for women and minority entrepreneurs both in Hollywood and Silicon Valley. And I come to this discussion just having witnessed um, a CNN presentation called Black in America uh, by Soledad O'Brien uh, this past weekend, which I found very, very interesting. Having said that, I'd like to direct my first question to Maria Palante, uh, U.S. Copyright Registrar. User-generated content Websites like Facebook and YouTube are enormously popular. Individuals and groups use these platforms to share videos that range from fraternity and sorority step shows and high school talent shows to videos of kids performing a new dance or imitating 
a new music video. Many up-and-coming artists who don't have record deals also use UGC sites to showcase their talents covering popular songs. Now, to the extent many uploaded video clips feature the use of copyrighted music and other types of content that is not for profit or commercial gain, do you think that this bill would include a safe harbor, fair use exception, or other explicit provision that would ensure we aren't trying to subject parity and leisurely activities to felony uh, penalties? Are you at all concerned that some of this section's broader language could have unintended consequences that may chill the use of UGC sites and digital platforms that have served an important social utility? Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not concerned as it's written. The, we're talking about two different levels of activity. This bill would go after sites dedicated to infringement. I think what is on the table in this room is a position that one can be compliant with the DMCA through notice and takedown of very specific sites when notified and therefore not have an obligation to participate in a solution that is about broad, willful, criminal, egregious, dedicated activity. Two different, they, these two things are, will operate at the same time and the notice and takedown system will remain intact. Also, um, I would like to ask about um, another issue that I'm very concerned with, and I would like to direct this to uh, Ms. Catherine Oyama, uh, to Google. I'm very concerned about the voluntary authority and legal immunity. The bill gives internet service providers to block access to sites they reasonably believe are infringing sites. This provision would seem to run counter to the FCC's recently issued open internet net neutrality rules. I can foresee cases in which an internet service provider that owns online content may use the section as pretext to unfairly block access to a competing website that is not really dedicated to infringement. This section does not require credible claims, merely a reasonable belief that doesn't exclude commercial disputes or anti-competitive conduct. It is my understanding that the Senate doesn't have ISP's voluntary block and uh, authority in its bill. Can you foresee any unintended consequences with the voluntary blocking provisions? Is there a way that this bill could be refined to ensure that voluntary actions are based on credible evidence and certain thresholds? Sure, thank you. Um, so we do see today the internet used by um, countless small businesses to facilitate communication, to facilitate e-commerce. It is um, truly people's um, daily livelihood. And so we do think that there should be due process built in if um, something essential to your site, like your services, is going to be taken away. Um, I think the provision you are mentioning is section 104 in the bill. Um, I think the broader technology community shares those concerns. You know, one, if you look at the scope of sites that could be captured by a service provider's reasonable belief that they were dedicated to theft within the bill, that's a very broad group. And then two, the number of service providers that receive complete immunity for terminating service without going through a court, without going through due process, it's not just the providers that are required to take action under this bill, it's much broader, so it would include it would include advertisers, search engines, payment providers, but also domain name registers, um, ISPs, much broader, you know, much broader group of folks. Um, if you were to lose your domain name and you are a small and independent business, that, that is everything. Um, and so making sure that you are at least uh, protected by the terms of service when you sign up for a contract would, you know, probably make sense to us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance. Yeah. Of my Thank opinion. you, Ms. Waters. The gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate being recognized, and I appreciate the testimony of the witnesses. Uh, I wanted to just take a, a bit of a, a different tack here, if I could. And um, looking at the, uh, the fraudulent Internet sites and the, the piece of this that's the direct focus of this hearing, and I'm just looking through some of the, some of the background material, um, the problem of illegal pirating of copyrighted intellectual property. And I would think that um, it, it is all um, trademarks and, and copyrights and patents altogether that I think about, uh, not just websites and things that we can look at. 
And so the, um, there's a pattern across this country or across the world of certain countries that are pretty effective at this. And I just ask if there's anybody on the panel, just raise your hand or answer. Um, do you have a list of countries that are the most egregious violators of intellectual property rights from an American perspective? Yes, sir. I can't read your names. I'm sorry. So, uh, thank you, Congressman. It's Mike Lillary. I, the, the, sorry, the content industries contribute each year to something uh, with, through the State Department. There's a number of different ways. There's the notorious markets filing, which chronicles of the areas of the world where this is the most problematic. And then there's the special 301 process, whereby the United States puts forward a list and kind of categorizes where countries fall in terms of their protection and intellectual property. And the reason for that, frankly, very simply, is that intellectual property is not just an American problem, it's a global problem. And what you're seeing around the world is that other countries are starting to recognize the benefit of not just protecting American intellectual property, but protecting their own. I would note, for example, that there are at least 16 countries in the world that engage in site blocking now, which has been the focus of some of the debate here. The internet seems to be working fine in those countries. Um, it seems to be having an impact in terms of taking sites like the Pirate Bay, which is blocked in many other countries but not in the United States, offline. So in many ways, the United States has historically been a world leader. But the truth of the matter, Congressman, from our perspective, is if we don't step up and deal with the problems we have today, we're going to cede that ground. And we're not going to be the, the world leader. And that's, that's unfortunate for our country because we do lead the world in the production of intellectual property. And we ought to be leading the world in protecting it. Mr. O'Leary, do you have an opinion then? Uh, you've you've uh, given me a couple of sources I might look at. Do you have, can, do you have a recollection on from which countries originate the greatest theft of intellectual property? Off the top of my head, I would hesitate to list them in, in any type of specific order. I mean, there are different problems in different parts of the world. There are hard goods problems, which is kind of the more traditional disk type piracy that occurs in places like Russia. There are problems with online. A country like Spain has a significant online piracy problem. There are other part places in Europe. We would be happy to provide you and the committee with a complete list. I'm, I'm hesitant to speculate because I don't trust my memory well enough to get them in the right order. Is China on your list? China's on the list, yes. And uh, there's definitely a piracy problem in China, yes. And do you have any recollection of what the uh, loss might be to American property rights holders? Uh, I don't, in China? off the top of my head. I would be, I'm not sure, frankly, that there's a way to measure it given the, the realities of China. Would anyone in the panel be aware of any studies that, uh, that have a U.S. trade representative? Uh, it seems to me that three or four years ago, at least, the U.S. trade representative has a, um, has a study done that calculates that loss of U.S loss to U.S. intellectual property rights holders to different nations. China, Russia comes to mind. Uh, anyone care to answer that? I saw a nod on the end of the line to... Uh, to well, uh, Maria Palante from the Copyright Maria. Office. I don't, I don't have the dollar amount for you, but I would just echo what Michael said, which is that a special 301 process that identifies uh, problematic standards in our trading partners when it comes to IP as well as notorious markets and websites. Does anyone have a, a more of a comprehensive solution? And we're talking about shutting down some websites. But it's billions in theft of intellectual property rights globally. Uh, and here we are, the United States of America, with the strongest, some of the strongest laws and the strongest traditions of respect for intellectual property. And I don't see a broader comprehensive solution to this. It seems to me that they can move faster than we can, we can adjust to them and that we're dealing with a component rather than the big picture. Is, yes, sir, Mr. O'Leary? Congressman, I would argue that you're correct in the sense that, that this is a, a global problem. It's multifaceted. There is not a single approach that fits. But it's critically important that the United States maintain the high ground and the leadership in this, because if we do not do it, other countries will not. I would also note that the problem you're highlighting about the criminals moving faster, that's true regardless of what the crime is. You ask anyone in law enforcement that they'll tell you, you catch the ones who keep doing the same thing and the people who would adapt and change, you have to keep changing them. Are you aware of any state-sponsored intellectual property rights theft? Are we worried about it? Are, are you aware of state-sponsored? We believe that that occurs, yes. And, I, and I'm going to say I believe that happens from China as probably the lead globally to do that. Does anyone disagree with that in the panel? I didn't hear any disagreement. I think <laughs> I've gone far enough with this since my red light came on. But I do appreciate your, uh, all of your testimony, and I hope we can bring some piece of solution to this, and I hope at some point we can bring a whole solution to it. Thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. King. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
this is indeed an important issue for us to work out, and, and, and the theft of uh, intellectual property is a great concern, uh, but it, nevertheless, the First Amendment issues are important, too. Uh, and my first thought is that it doesn't seem like you need, that there should be that much difference from what the Google folks and the techie folks are wanting and what the, the MPAA and the RIA and the other AAs want. Uh, have, let me ask maybe the gentleman from Motion Pictures, uh, who's uh, apparently got a Rick Perry problem with not being able to count to something, uh, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, have y'all not gotten together and tried to work this out and, and some way and fine tune this to where there aren't these issues of, of people being penalized that are not guilty and sites being, you know, shut down where there's just a small infringement but not a total infringement? Well, we don't believe that this legislation will result in either of those things happening, but we work with uh, Google, our studios work with Google on a regular basis. Uh, in terms of trying to get stuff taken down off the internet. There, there are ongoing relationships on this piece of legislation. There have not, to my knowledge, been specific discussions about this, but I want to be very clear. We have said from the beginning that if people are willing to come forward with constructive uh, suggestions on how to do things that are not a pretext for maintaining the status quo, that we would listen to those things. Wonderful. Ms. Oyama, do you have some, some sure. positive, you know, not under a pretense type pretext type of discussions that you'd like to come forth with? Yes. Um, so I think just in the broader context of figuring out how to go after piracy, it's really important to keep in mind the number one most effective tool um, for going after piracy would be to increase the amount of legitimate lawful services that are available on the internet, right? So if we can cut off the funding, we would decrease the supply of these pirate sites. If we could have more legitimate services for music and movies and everything else, which I know the studios um, are working very hard to do, that would also decrease the consumer demand for this type of... With, without uh, necessarily itemizing each of them now. Have you had sure. the opportunity to yeah. pose these to the other team? Yeah, so although we're here in D.C. today, I would assure you that all of our business partners, you know, on the West Coast are working very collaboratively, very, you know, much together um, to get to those solutions. Um, and we're always more than happy to continue to work with Mr. Lear O'Leary and others. So um, we say, are y'all yeah, working now trying to come up with some language that would maybe, that the chairman might put in a manager's amendment that would make all people happy? Um, you know, there's been some conversations. I think there would need to be a lot more. We I would have, hope there would yeah. be a lot more, and I think that's something that should take place. Let me ask you a question, uh, since I've got since you're at the microphone. Uh, there are a couple of, of uh, search engines in China and Russia, and Yandex, I think, is one of them, and Baidu, and some consider these rogue sites. And, and they, whether they are or not, I don't know. They could be. If 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 they were considered such, and they were blocked because they had some pirate-type folks among their constituency. Uh, how do you think the Chinese and Russians would respond toward, toward your company and toward the United States companies? Um, that's an excellent question. So um, I think we should realize that even though we would do something for really good reason here, it could potentially have international ramifications if the U.S. government is ordering U.S. companies to disappear foreign search engines from our results, um, it's, it should be expected that there's going to be some form of retaliation um, internationally. And, and those sites are the leading Chinese and Russian search engines, is that correct? Um, the sites that you mentioned are, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if we, is it possible under this legislation they'd be totally cut off entirely? They'd be... If they were deemed rogue sites right. under Section 102, um, they could, uh, search engines could receive an order to disappear the whole right. site. Um, it's really tough in a search engine because although you can remove the direct link from a search, you know, as long as this, a, a rogue site exists, people are still going to talk about it. They're still going to blog about it. They're still going to post about it. And so it's really not possible to remove all worldwide discussion of a link. Um, and that's why we support the follow the money type legislation because that's really going after the source of the problem um, by choking off their financial reason to exist. Let me ask you another question, or maybe to the panel. I have a, help me with my constituent services. We do great constituent services in Tennessee 9. And this week on 11-14, Ryan Turner wrote me an email, and he says, I'm writing as your constituent. As a constituent, I oppose this stop online piracy. I'm a student studying management of information systems. Should this pass, 
uh, I believe my future IT would be crippled. Having a government hand in DNS servers scares me, especially with the government suing website owners with one parent I, well, I think this is a misprint, but links as a content. As a college student who owns over 30 domain names, most of these places for third parties to post text responses. Should one of those include a link to material that infringe copyrights, now, now I would be held responsible. I have no funding available to handle these claims, and I'm lucky enough to be trained on how to handle lawsuits, but many, I, many other entrepreneurs without formal training have no idea how to handle it. Uh, would if, if he had this and there was one text that came back that was uh, maybe linked to an illegal site, uh, would he be cut off, and would he have to then go to uh, hire a lawyer and possibly go to court? I think so. I think there's two ways that could happen. Um, so one of the concerns, you know, that not just Google, but the other technology companies who endorse the testimony, um, the other trade associations are concerned about is that the definition in 103 of what is a site dedicated to theft is very broad. There's some language in there that also refers to a site or a portion of a site. So people have a lot of serious questions about what does that mean? Are we looking at a full site or are we looking at, you know, in today's internet, the way most websites work, um, there's real-time communication, and so you have lots of real-time comments, you have lots of real-time posts. If one comment or post is infringing, does that you know, impugn the entire site, or are we looking at it holistically? Um, there's some other words in the definition that give people concern that, that it's overbroad. Um, so either being swept in in that way or under the um, very broad immunities that are being given to service providers, um, pretty much anyone who qualifies under the definition of a qualifying plaintiff, which is very broad, they could go to a, a payment or advertising um, service provider, they could allege um, that the, the person that you mentioned is dedicated to theft, and then those providers have complete immunity to shut him off. So there's kind of, there's a concern that there's a strong incentive in the bill um, that if you wanted to immunize yourself, the easy thing to do would be to comply with that notice and shut them off. Yeah. Um, the and gentleman's then, time has expired, and um, I don't mean to cut you off, but you could bring your answer to a quick conclusion. Or is that, have you finished? I think that's good. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think you could go the longer. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Quayle, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. Mr. Yama, I want to go back to what you were just talking about earlier about how long-term we can address the pirate, piracy issues via um, more legitimate websites that provide legitimate content on the Internet. And I want to go to your testimony that you indicated that the only long-term way to beat piracy online is to offer consumers more compelling, legitimate alternatives. And you cited YouTube's uh, free ad-based model for monetizing content. Um, I mean, there could be some disagreement. I don't know what's the best way to monetize content, whether it's fee-based or free ad-based. Um, and if you look over the course of history, um, except for broadcast, it seems like most quality content has not been given away for free. Um, so. One thing that I want to ask you is, would you agree that the piracy issues that we're have dealing with and the pirate websites that we're dealing with actually makes it more difficult for a company to start a fee-based site that offers legitimate content, and thus it forces content providers to look for ways that are going towards web and ad-based, um, I mean ad-based content to give it away for free? I think there's so many different models in the ecosystem right now. Certainly the problem of piracy is, is um, of tremendous importance and great concern to any content provider, right? You want to have control over the distribution of your content. Some people choose to release it for free because they want to participate with their fans in that way. Others want to license it and others want to have an adv advertising model. I think the kind of beauty of all the new services that we're seeing is there's no one size fits all. Um, I do think we would approach YouTube as a really great example of how kind of technology and copyright can work together. Um, there's a tool on YouTube called Content ID. Because YouTube is a hosted platform, we host all the content, so it's on our servers. Um, so through Content ID, we're able immediately, a rights holder would give us their file. Um, if a user uploads a piece of content, we would immediately scan um, six million reference files. And we could capture if their song or their movie was being uploaded, and then the rights holder would have control whether to monetize but, or not. But I think my, my more direct question is that if we don't, aren't able to crack down and have the tools and the ability to crack down on the pirate, pirate websites, then you are actually forcing content providers into a narrow avenue of ad-based um, prov providing only content via ad-based and free markets, and that, not free markets, but free, uh, free content. So both, both would be tremendously important, right? Increasing it, exactly. license but, and I mean, it kind of goes, it, when, you're, when you're looking at that and how we need to crack down on the piracy, 
ad-based, which is the model that Google uses, and that seems to be why one of the reasons you would be pushing for that, because that is the way that, that Google makes their money, right? Uh, there's different ways, but that's, that's the primary, primary way, way for sure, yeah. And I think that that's just my biggest concern is that if you're looking at just ad-based, you're cutting down one significant avenue for people to provide content. Um, and if we don't shut down these pirate websites, then we're going to actually lose out on different types of business models, different types of mm -hmm. content providing. Right. And that, that, that was right. the, the point I wanted to make. Um, Ms. Palante, I want to go to you. Earlier you stated in your opening testimony that uh, you do not believe that the safe harbors under the DMCA are actually weakened um, by SOPA. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, first of all, the bill says that. And secondly, uh, as a savings clause. And secondly, uh, there's no monetary relief. The injunctions that are allowed are already permitted under the DMCA. Uh, you, there are, contrary to popular belief, ways to get an, an, to enjoin certain action for search engines and ISPs. And uh, they're really des this, this bill is really designed to sit next to the DMCA. The DMCA is related to particular files on a website and does not require the participation of those who are really in a good position to help stem the tide of piracy. So what I would object to, I mean, I object to a couple of things that I've just heard from my witness, my fellow witness. Is, one is that um, I'm pretty sure that Google just said that it's the fault of content owners that we have rogue websites. Uh, that, that just can't be the truth. Secondly, um, although follow the money could be effective, it does not bring in everybody in the, web, in, in the ecosystem. It doesn't bring in ISPs. It doesn't bring in search engines. It doesn't account for the vast number of websites that offer content purposely for free. And it doesn't really address the broader rule of law issue that we have on the internet right now. And under the DMCA, are there actually instances where a service provider can take down all content on a web page or on a website if there is infringing content on that website? The only way I see that happening is if every single rights holder comes together at the same time and approaches the website. And, and, and every file is actually infringing. So, so it, could be, it could be possible under the DMCA? <laughs> it's highly unlikely. Okay. <laughs> um, but the one thing I wanted to just get your final thoughts on, because the opponents, uh, opponents of the bill actually say that it's going to endanger the security and the integrity of the Internet. Um, one of the things that the Internet has been very good at is in commerce. And wouldn't it also be fair to say that w without shutting down these pirate websites, um, then we are also endangering the security and the integrity of the Internet because they are putting out uh, also often counterfeit goods and also infringe copyright material. Right. So there are three per underlying purposes. One is to um, protect content owners for, for about their own property. The second is to uh, allow those who want to invest a place where there's sunshine and oxygen and a good environment for that. And the third is to protect consumers. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Can I Thanks. just clarify one point? Sure. I just wanted to make sure that nothing was mischaracterized because I do not think um, that it's the fault of the rights holders. Um, certainly, rights holders have uh, the right to protect their content however they want, and we are completely committed to going after piracy. My only point was that the success and the consumer appetite for services like Netflix and iTunes shows that there's a lot of different licensing models out can I, there. Can I follow up on that, on, on one point, which I think is a practical point, which is being missed to Mr. Quayle's question? There are legitimate services out there now. There are more of them than there have been before. There will be more of them tomorrow. The problem is, is that when you go to Google and you punch in the name of the movie, those legitimate sites are buried on page eight of the search results. Hmm. There is a better than average chance that Pirate Bay is going to end up ahead of Netflix. That's a fundamental problem, no matter how many legitimate sites are out there, that we can't overcome and we can't do anything about. If we could get Google to re-index those sites in a way that favored legitimacy, to, to your question, Congressman Quayle, the consumers would be getting to those first. But when Netflix is buried way down in the search results, it doesn't matter how good Netflix is going gonna, is gonna to be. And that's just a practical problem that could be addressed today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Quayle. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to ask about the uh, savings clause, and I'd like to ask uh, both uh, Ms. Oyama and uh, uh, Mr. O'Leary uh, about your uh, opinion on this. Uh, I'm aware that um, concerns have been raised by uh, Internet companies and many others that the language of the bill may have unintended consequences, and even though 
everybody agrees that the problem of foreign rogue sites um, is, is critical and, and that we need to cut revenue to these sites. Um, there may be disagreement on the language uh, as drafted. Um, and I think it's really important that we try to reach some common ground, uh, that we work through language that is balanced and effective and make sure that we don't have unintended consequences. Uh, one of the areas of disagreement uh, on the on the Stop Island Online Piracy Act is on um, this question of, of the savings clause and uh, whether there is the immunity uh, that is provided under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for search engines and internet service providers. Um, and so I would like to have your different opinions because uh, there, uh, I, I, some have represented to me that the Senate bill has a savings clause that seems to address this, but SOPA does not. Um, and uh, is that is that true? Uh, I'd like to have your different uh, opinions on this, uh, Ms. Yaman, than Mr. O'Leary. Sure. Um, so this is actually, it sounds technical, the savings clause, but it is of critical importance to the technology industry. Um, businesses today really build their business models under the safe harbors um, that they know that they have under the DMCA. So if a technology company receives notice of infringement, they are required to expeditiously um, remove that infringement, but they don't have kind of a general monitoring um, obligation. So. The, the balance that we're trying to um, strike in any legislation would be if there are intermediaries who are required to do new things under this bill, that the bill would be really clear. Advertiser, shut off your services. Payments, shut off your services. Um, and that would be clear and we would take those obligations. We want to make sure that this bill that's going after rogue sites doesn't strip us of those important safe harbors um, in kind of unrelated uh, litigation or you know, uh, open the possibility that those types of orders could be used to establish red flag knowledge. Um, and so there's some language that we propose that would kind of alleviate that concern and, and keep this bill as effective um, as it needs to be to go after rogue sites. Um, but, but a savings clause to make sure that we're not opening ourselves up to liability in a way that we would somehow need to proactively monitor all user-generated content um, in real time is, is really important to us. Mr. O'Leary. Congressman, I would just associate myself with the comments and the testimony provided by the Register of Copyrights. This legislation is a complement to the DMCA. It doesn't impugn those rights or the safe harbor in any shape, way, shape, or form. The DMCA deals with good actors, legitimate services that are trying to take steps to get infringing stuff off of their sites. Rogue sites deal with a group of people that under no definition would fit underneath the DMCA. They are bad actors. They are dedicated to infringement. These actually fit together. They complement each other. In no sense does this undermine the DMCA. I think Monty. if that's the case, a one sentence clarifying that in any legislation would be tremendously helpful. Ms. Pallante, what, what is your opinion on this? On the savings clause and whether there are enough protections uh, and DMCA is not. Um, uh, right. So again, the, the, thank you for the question. The question, again, is just, uh, just be, well, the, the, the problem is just because somebody may be compliant under the DMCA does not mean that they shouldn't take action if the attorney general finds that there's a foreign infringing site run by criminals who are engaged in piracy. That is a, 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 just an unfair uh, comparison. And this bill, uh, if that is the argument, this bill does allow for that. And I, it's my view that it should. Okay. Well, I'd uh, like to ask a different question, and that is about job creation. Uh, there are some that are saying SOPA would stifle innovation and job growth, uh, and that uh, with the Grovester opinion, that um, uh, which uh, was a finding by the U.S. Supreme Court that it contributed to infringement, that venture capital would dry up. But uh, Mr. Almeida, um, in your testimony, you noted that uh, you represent over four million U.S. workers, and on their behalf, support the uh, that you actually support the Stop Online Piracy Act as an important jobs bill. Um, how do you respond to these claims that, that uh, this legislation would stifle innovation and job growth? I, th I think uh, innovation is alive and well in, in the U.S., and I don't see this as stifling it in the least. Our members work in the United States. They're taxpayers. They go to work. They make products that we view as entertainment. That is what we see this on online piracy infringing on. And you can't 
hit a price point when someone's giving it away for free to make a business model to compete with free. It also has to do with um, constructive innovation, and we believe in constructive innovation, like Netflix, as opposed to uh, TV Shack uh, dot, uh, BZ, which is an infringing site that should be taken down. Thank you. I yield back. Did she yield back? Did you yield back? Uh, yes, thank I you, yield Mr. back. Thank you, Mr. Chu. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all y'all for, for being here. Uh, this panel or this committee is made up of former prosecutors, defense lawyers, and there are even two former judges here. Uh, and back in my experience on the bench down at the courthouse or the Palace of Perjury, as I referred to it in those days, uh, saw a lot of thieves. And it's, uh, um, you know, stealing is stealing, and thieves are people we ought to deal with. Uh, I disagree with you, Mr. O'Leary. They're not bad actors. They're thieves. And this legislation is trying to get a grip on this. We've got three, really, three groups that are here. We have the credit card companies, we have the search engine folks, and the content providers. Uh, if I had my way, I would lock all three of you in a room and don't say, don't come out till you all agree, uh, and uh, then we could solve it, uh, I, would, I would think. Um, if you pull up, as I did, you pull up uh, on Google search engine, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas or Harry Potter, free Harry Potter movies or free The Grinch That Stole Christmas, um, you get a lot of free sites on there. And as, as a consumer, I can't tell who's a thief and who's not a thief. Uh, and I know Google is doing a lot, uh, millions of sites and all of that. I've heard the testimony. But at the point we are now, what can, can Google offer to this bill that Google would sign on to the bill specifically? Sure. Um, so to, to your point about the search results, one of the major commitments that we made this year was to improve the tools to make sure that when rights holders notify us, those search uh, results will be disabled in the search. Um, and so the commitment that we had made at the beginning of the year was to reduce the turnaround time to under 24 hours. Um, and so we're happy to say right now it's, under, it's six hours or less is the average turnaround. In terms okay. of what we could do affirmatively. Yes. Um, From this day forward, you pull up the Grinch who stole yeah. Christmas and you keep going page so, after page for free Grinches. So long as those sites are there, they are going to show up um, on the Internet. And so we think that legislation that would target the source of those sites is necessary. Um, what we would do is uh, we would support legislation that would go through the Department of Justice. So you would have um, a law enforcement aspect. You would have a court determine that a site is dedicated to infringement. Um, and you could serve those orders on US-based um, payment providers and advertising. We have Google Checkout for payment. We have AdSense, AdWords, a lot of different advertising products that would directly regulate and impact our business. But we think that if we can break the financial ties for those sites, then that is really smart, targeted, and effective, and would avoid some of the collateral damage that um, we have discussed earlier this morning. So your answer is just go after the finances. Cut From off the money. Fall, yeah, cut off the money. Uh, so if there was something that we added to the bill that would cut off the money, then Google may support it. Yeah, is that what so you're there's telling? certainly um, concepts in the bill that, that reflect that. Um, we think. Uh, if you look at WikiLeaks, that is how they've been taken out, is by cutting off the money. It's an approach that U.S. law enforcement uses um, for many different international problems, you know, narcotics, terrorism. I mean, it's been a proven way. If you cut off someone's financial incentive, they're not going to want to pay for the servers and the bandwidth and the infrastructure to run these websites. Okay. Let, let me be a little more specific. What can Google do? Not what the financial providers can do. What can Google do to move this legislation forward? Um, so there's a lot we're doing in the private sector, but in terms of the legislation, we would publicly support um, legislation like what I described, follow the money approach. We would be happy to do that. We'd be happy to work with your staffs on legislation in that way um, if it can avoid the collateral damage that we've discussed and if we got a good definition of what's a rogue site that didn't sweep in legitimate U.S. businesses. But you can't tell when you pull it up, the Grinch who stole Christmas, who's the real Grinch and who's not. Uh, you get all the page after page of free Grinches. 
That's why court adjudication or cooperation with rights holders is, is really important. There's lots of um, legitimate free movies. There's lots of, you know, uh, content that just the, the middleman wouldn't really know if that was licensed or infringing. Yeah, you want to weigh in on that, Mr. O'Leary? And then you know, I think <clears throat> you use the example of the Grinch. There's a movie right now, as I mentioned earlier, called J. Edgar. The only lawful place you can see that movie is in a theater. If you go back to your office and put J. Edgar into Google, you're going to get the same list of eight pages of sites where it's free. That movie is not available for free anywhere. If you want to see it, you have to go to a theater right now. So I understand the complexity when you're talking about something that is perhaps not in the theater, but this is actually in the theater right now. And there's no reason for it to be online in any fashion, frankly. I also think that what is being proposed, what, what was being suggested is, as I said earlier, we should follow everybody's money. And isolating one or two things, that doesn't solve the search engine problem that we've been talking about, and we think that should be a part of the discussion, too. We think it requires all of the people that are involved in this to work together to get it done. Kind of to your theory of throw everybody in a room and sort it out. If everybody doesn't go in the room, at the beginning, you're not going to sort it out. Well, maybe we need a court order to get you all three there in the room. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. Maybe get the FBI to help you on that J. Edgar Hoover stuff. <laughs> um, Mr. Deutsch, recognize the next five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, it's not just J. Edgar. I, uh, I have teenage daughters who are awfully excited about the new Breaking Dawn movie, which is coming out. You can watch that right now online for free. Uh, what, I, what troubles me about this whole exchange, quite frankly, is it, on the one hand, there's this great technology, Ms. Ayama, that you're so proud to trumpet, understandably, about from YouTube and what YouTube does in order to prevent illegal content from being posted. Yet, when you enter Breaking, watch Breaking Dawn for free, and you can do it online now, there you throw your arms up in the air. Woe is us. There's nothing we can do. So I can understand how that would feel frustrating. Um, te technologically, there's a distinction. So on YouTube, the content that's posted on YouTube is hosted on our servers. So we're able to match files. If someone tries to upload something on YouTube, we have a reference file we can match against. We don't control the World Wide Web. For I under so I understand that's a technology issue. We could talk more about that. I have another question for you. There, there is, um, the, this has been a, a fruitful exchange, um, different than I might have expected from from the way, as a number of us have, referred, have referenced already, the way this debate has played out in the local press in particular. I, I, don't, know whether, I don't know whether Google shares the position publicly that this <laughs> bill will kill the internet and all of the advertisements that have resulted in all the phone calls that we've received in our office, um, but I, I do wonder whether there is any base level here that you would agree needs to be tackled. And, and so, I mean, if we, if the issue is the language that says uh, a portion thereof, let's assume that the bill didn't have that language in there. So you can't argue that Twitter would have to be taken down, which, by the way, is an argument that, that is, uh, there's no basis for that argument under this bill. You can't argue under this bill that Facebook would have to be taken down. There's no basis for that under this proposed bill. And I think, I think that, that you understand that, notwithstanding the reference to individual tweets that might lead a whole site to be taken down. My question is, if that language weren't in there, are there any of these websites that, that you believe should be taken down and that uh, Google ought to play a role in helping us accomplish that? Yes. Um, we would be happy to work um, with the chairman, with your office, on a follow the money legislation. Okay. Well, let, let me, I understand so you don't like the way it's, the, the bill is written. Let me ask you about that because you've referred, you've made many references today to following the money. Um, yesterday, your chairman recommended regulations based on tracing payments spent at websites offering illegal materials as a replacement for this bill, consistent with what you've said today. Um, many of the offshore sites clearly engaging in theft are driven by, as you point out, are driven by ad revenue, not just credit card transactions. And if we follow, if we want to follow the money, uh, we can't just focus on the credit cards, obviously. We have to focus on the ads. Google, at least from the statistics I've been told, retains over 75% of all search advertising revenue in the U.S. Therefore, following the money leads us to you. So tell me, what, tell me the steps that Google has taken already, understanding that you're concerned about these, this intellectual property theft, understanding the impact that it's going to have, it has every day on our economy. Tell me the steps that Google has taken to, to 
combat it under using the follow the money approach that you favor. Okay. Um, so just to confirm, and uh, legislation that would go after ads is a big part I, of our business. I understand. In terms of, I, I understand. But given, and we're happy to support that. Um, I understand that. But tell me what you've done okay. now in the absence, because we all acknowledge right. this is an important issue. So, and, right. and, and and if the seventy five and one shouldn't active, prevent the other, right? Right. You can play a significant yes. role today. So if you could just speak to what you've okay. what you've done. Um, so the, there were some major commitments that our general counsel, Kent Walker, made at the beginning of the year. I'll just try to tick off um, the major ones, but we should probably follow up with your office on, on more specifics. Um, for would, DMCA, we've removed more than $5 million infringing files this year as when rights holders notified us. One of the concerns we had heard is that there was some grit in the system and that there was frustration that it was taking too long. So we invested significant engineering hours and money to improve the tool. I, I, Sam, I hate to cut you off. I don't have a lot of time here, but I, I would... I'd ask that you follow up. Um, I know, I remember Mr. Walker's testimony. I followed up with a letter after that hearing requesting all sorts of information that that letter is still not, I've not received a response. So I hope that, I hope that a response will be forthcoming to that letter and to the request that I've made here today. Um, I, I just, I'd like to, to finish with this. This notion that we're going to break the internet that somehow we're going to stifle innovation. The, the fact that the kids serving me coffee at Starbucks told me, hey, I hear you're taking up legislation that's going to make it impossible for me to download music. The, the fact is, what we're worried about is, and the reason this legislation, the reason we're having this discussion, what we're worried about is not stifling that innovation in the future. That's a concern that we all have. I don't believe that the legislation does that. But we know right now, if we do nothing, that the film industry uh, and those young directors who are starting out aren't going to be able to do their craft, and we're not going to have the next Adele, and we're not going to have the next Drake, because they're not going to be compensated for their work. And I, I hope that as we go forward and as you provide those answers, that we can have an honest discussion about, about what's really at stake here, and, and, and let's move past these, these, uh, these attacks on those of us who believe this and, and suggest that somehow we're going to mean an end to the internet. It's not, it's not accurate. I think, I think you understand that it's not accurate, and it doesn't do the, uh, the American economy any, any great service at all. And uh, with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and uh, the gentleman from Texas, uh, the other gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, is uh, recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, there we go. Uh, Again, I also appreciate your being here. It is a tough subject. Um, and we're dealing with intellectual property here. And I, like my friend uh, Judge Poe, was a district judge and also a chief justice. And we dealt with uh, what wasn't called uh, bad actors. Uh, you know, you, de you dealt with theft. And that's really what we're talking about here. It's a crime. It's theft. We don't want thieves working their way through an honest, legitimate, wonderful means of, uh, in this case, the Internet. Now, in the past, uh, some have used the analogy of the pawn shop that, uh, you know, the pawn shop can't uh, intentionally and knowingly uh, assist in theft. And so there were laws made, most states have them, where people, the law enforcement can go in and get information. Now, I know and I've been resistant to uh, some of the pushes to force Internet providers, search engines, into doing things that we don't even require pawn shops to. And I thought uh, some were going overboard in trying to make demands on uh, uh, search engines that we don't even demand of pawn shops. But on the other hand, there there is um, this aspect of our criminal law and every state has it, the federal government has it, anyone who aids, abeds, encourages, in any way assists someone in committing a crime, the law is very clear in every state and the federal code, you're just as guilty as if you committed the crime yourself. question is, do you intentionally or knowingly aid? Well, it's been brought up often enough, there, there are thieves using the Internet, and... I keep hearing from people who say, look, if, if it were illegal for me to use that free website, then how come I get it access so easily? They are expecting us to do something. 
And I think most of us were hoping that there would be something worked out between the interests here. But uh, I can give you an example. I know what the law is. And I was, uh, I was, I had an eight track warm shade of ivory, Henry Mancini back in college. And it got me through some all nighters, that and Jonathan Livingston Seagull soundtrack. And uh, so anyway, uh, Sleepless in Seattle has the song in the wee small hours of the morning. And I wanted to get that. I wanted to download it. I'd paid two bucks for it, but not just 99 cents. Uh, nobody has it except some free websites. I knew not to go use those and download it free because it's illegal. Most people don't. So when we talk about follow the money, we're talking about something terribly difficult in going to China, going to Russia, and trying to follow the money over there. We're not getting help from those folks. Uh, Marsha Blackburn and I met with uh, their folks in, in China that handle this stuff, and it seemed pretty clear to me we weren't going to get a whole lot of help out of them. So what should we do to keep from hurting the innovation of the Internet and Google and Bing and these, these folks that come up with great ideas. But at the same time, balance the interest in this being a law-abiding society. And I'm gratified to hear people on both sides of the aisle have similar concerns. So it just doesn't seem to me to be that onerous to say, if someone goes to court, for heaven's sakes, and, and proves w with probable cause standard that somebody's committing a crime of theft and then that is presented to an internet provider a search engine these people are committing a crime there's probable cause to believe that's justification for a warrant why that's too onerous to say don't make them accessible and I'm still having trouble understanding that and I would welcome comments uh, in that regard from whoever wishes to thank you Thanks. Um, I think we completely agree about the um, importance of having um, a federal judge uh, play the role of an arbiter so that um, folks' uh, services aren't being terminated just by um, a five-day notice to their provider without the ability to appear or defend themselves. Um, I think to, to your point about what we can do, it's, it's uh, probably three things. So one would be building on the DMCA. Under the DMCA today, search results can be line edited out if a rights holder tells a search engine to remove a piece of content. Um, we have worked incredibly hard over the last year to improve our tools. The average turnaround time today is six hours if we receive notice. So we're working really hard on improving that. It's not perfect. It's not done. It's something we'll continue to work on. Um, the second piece, though, would be to, be, to build on that um, and to come together and support legislation that would impose new obligations on other providers. So we are also an advertising provider, largely an advertising provider, um, a payment provider. Uh, a judicial process where uh, a court determined that a site was dedicated to infringement and then instructed um, US-based intermediaries to shut off financial ties to that website, that's the most important and effective thing we could do. If we can um, knock them off at their knees and we can cut off their financial ties, they won't have a reason to be in business anymore. They won't be making money. That's the effective way to go. And then the third piece would be to get rid of the ineffective and harmful pieces. So. Um, I realize reasonable people can disagree about this, but there is a tremendous concern in the technology industry about some of the remedies that are being proposed and some of the unintended consequences that would have, you know, potentially very severe um, repercussions for, um, for the Internet network, for people's um, security, and for free speech concerns. Um, so getting the balance right is, is something we think is important. We certainly think that there is a way forward um, and a way that we could all agree on going after these sites. And Would ask, the gentleman yield? Uh, well, I'd ask unanimous consent to allow others to finish answering because there's a couple of ends. And uh, I certainly... Gentleman is extended another minute. Uh, you had a request to I, comment. I, I'd just add that <clears throat> in regard to your comments about thievery and, and Congressman Pose. From our industry's perspective, it's more than thievery. It's, 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 it's murder. Uh, we do feel, I, I particularly feel, and I have 28 years of federal law enforcement, I know crime when I see it, and I see counterfeit medicines as actually attempted murder. I mean, it's not quick, it's not immediate, but when you're only giving a, a patient 20% of the medicine they need to kill, cure their cancer or their, their heart problems or their high blood pressure, you're in fact killing them slowly 
But, but that's the issue here. And it's well, as a prosecutor, you know that may not be murder. It may be negligent homicide or, or other, some other type of homicide. Along those lines. And, and it's frustrating if we are not immediately making progress in cutting that down. I've, I've worked with CBP in, in pilot programs, and I'm seeing the counterfeits flooding in because of the, the purchases over the Internet from the rogue mm -hmm. websites that are selling counterfeit medicines. And it's incredulous to me how much is coming into the United States. So I would say, you know, this bill is going forward with ex demonstrating that we need to change the status quo. We can't accept what's, ex you know, existing right now. And I agree very much that we have to demonstrate to people that there are consequences, and this is a serious crime. Right. When you look at six months, four months, three years, you say your cost of doing business, it's, it, it, it can't be that bad if that's all they're going to give. So I, I also see the, the Title II in this as, as very, very significant as well. Was there anybody else want to comment? All right. Thank you. Would the uh, gentleman yield? Yes, sir. I, I just wanted to briefly, one of the, I think it was Mr. O'Leary suggested that if you type in J. Edgar, movie, uh, J. Edgar movie, you get all these infringing sites. I just did that. And what you get is the Showtimes in Washington, a review, mm -hmm. the Wikipedia article, the trailer from uh, Warner Brothers, several reviews of the movie, the iTunes trailer, there's not a single infringing site that comes up. So I just th thought yeah. we well, should we'll reclaim it. Right. Well, the, the gentleman, the I gentleman think yield. If you use the word free in there, that's where those things come well, up. But yes, I yield. Would you yield? Well, I just did the same thing. And on. Uh, use Google or. Uh, uh, I just used Google Googled or it, Bing. Googled it, Googled it. Watch Jagger Hoover free online on YouTube. Full version shows you how to download it, no cost. Right here. Well, I, I did a different search engine, but the point I'm trying to make. What free? It, it, uh, well, the gentleman. Going, going back to. Yeah, uh, reclaiming my time. Uh, uh, I don't know what. The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Okay. It, it, I would ask that the gentleman be granted 15 seconds, and so I might say just in answer to. The point is okay, the search engines are not capable of actually censoring the entire World Wide Web. That's the problem. You can't do that. And so we need to go after the people who are committing crimes in a way that's going to work. I think we can do that, but this bill is not it. And I think well, the well, with all due respect, I want well, to show the Reclaiming my time. I, the I agree, time but uh, we also need to cut off the getaway car. And with that, and I, I'm not sure what the gentlelady has against Google, but I respect her using Bing and yield back my time. The gentleman yields back time he does not have. Um, <laughs> I'm going to accuse you of being a liberal here in a minute. Um, Mr. Johnson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, uh, SOPA requires payment networks Thanks. like MasterCard to suspend payment transactions between a U.S. customer and an online merchant within five days. Uh, according to Ms. Kirkpatrick's testimony, um, there are very legitimate challenges uh, that uh, payment ne networks uh, have in meeting such a short deadline, especially considering the multiple players involved in an online transaction. The Senate version requires payment networks to take action as expeditiously as reasonable. Earlier this year, uh, the White House negotiated a best practices document with the payment industry that has a reasonable period of time standard. Which uh, of these standards is acceptable to you? The within five days under SOPA, the as expeditiously as reasonable under the Senate version? and a reasonable period of time as negotiated between the White House and uh, uh, the uh, payment industry? Uh, yes, sir. I think it's a, a legitimate question and one that we believe can be resolved favorably well, to everyone. Which one do you think is, uh, is uh, most acceptable to I, you? As, as I sit here right now, I'm not prepared to pick between the three, quite honestly. I, I certainly understand the point that was made by our, our colleagues at MasterCard. If it's not possible, you've done within five days. We certainly don't want to create a time limit which forces them into an impossible situation. At the All same right. time, we would like the legislation to recognize that if someone's trying to 
run the clock out, they don't don't do that. If if I give you, if I open up the tent for you to stick your uh, (laughs) nose in, boy, you're going to get all the way up in there. I'm uh, I'm just appreciating your gift of uh, of, of gab. (laughs) But if I might ask Mr. Clark the same question. I feel the same way. Okay, all right. Sorry, I I feel the same way. All right, Ms. Palante. Uh, Section 506 of the Copyright Act establishes criminal liability for the willful infringement of a copyright. Recently, there has been confusion as to the definition of that term, willful. Do you think that willfulness is the same as uh, intentional? Or uh, does the act... Uh, tell me about the difference between those two standards. Right, so that's a great question. And uh, the point of SOPA is to capture those that uh, knowingly engage uh, in, a, in a known legal duty. And that is the standard that most courts have accepted. There are some exceptions to that. Um, I think that's something that could be clarified in the bill, in legislative history, perhaps. Mm-hmm. All right. Ms. Uh, Oyama. The DMCA and Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act represent the legal underpinnings of the view that intermediaries need not monitor or supervise the communications of users. It is a view that we have long touted and pushed across the world through various diplomatic channels. We have harshly criticized governments who use such virtual walls to prevent citizen access to the internet. Uh, China is a great example. With that in mind, would this legislation allow companies to demand that search engines located inside the U.S. censor where American consumers are able to go on the internet? And um, how would this legislation likely be viewed by uh, China and other, and uh, Iran and other uh, countries that uh, put these roadblocks up uh, in terms of content uh, uh, to their citizens on the internet. And um, how would that affect our diplomacy? Thanks. Um So for the DMCA piece that you mentioned, I think we would certainly agree that DMCA has proved to be a foundation for American innovation and has struck a balance. So if you're a new company, you're starting up, you know what the laws are, you have certainty, um, and it also helps rights holders. If a rights holder is aware that there's infringing content on the service provider, they just need to let us know. Um, Web hosting companies, search engines, we will remove access to that content. It strikes the right balance. Um, it It takes care of infringing speech. It leaves up um, legitimate speech, um, and it reflects a careful balance. It also, because of the way web services are used today, we see all over the place when there's real-time events, it's important that a web platform enables that type of real-time communication or real-time e-commerce. If you didn't have the DMCA and an intermediary platform was required or potentially liable for what its users were posting in real time, you would have to implement some type of proactive monitoring system. It could really change the dynamics of the web today. Um, I think the second That would stifle the small uh, entrepreneur that's just getting started uh, more than it would hamper the uh, larger uh, providers of content. Uh, I think it's both, but It would be a burden on both. Yeah, if you're a new company starting up, you will have less money to invest in that type of monitoring. So certainly um, it would have an impact on small businesses. Um, to your question about, um, you know, kind of the speech aspect, you know, if we impose a law here which would have um, court orders uh, requiring of domestic search engines to make entire full websites disappear, um, and especially if there's some type of overbroad definition which, which would you know, capture also legitimate speech. You know, unfortunately, what we do here would have other ramifications. And we may think that this is a good reason. We do think it's a good reason here. 
but we see all the time for Google DMCA requests, competitors try to take each other down, pro-democracy um, speech tries to be quelled. We've seen in Libya and the recent activities there, different politicians trying to take each other's YouTube channels out um, because they disagree with their views. We see copyright used all the time as an excuse to quell speech. If we mandate this type of approach here, we really need to think carefully about what types of international ramifications that will have on free expression globally. The gentleman's Good. time has expired. If I might get uh, just one more question. All right, the gentleman's already had extra time, but so has everybody else, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, the Justice Department uh, has uh, uh, responsibilities under the, uh, under, uh, the uh, uh, SOPA Act, uh, while at the same time we've been talking about uh, downsizing government and in fact, the Justice Department has lost about 30% of their attorneys. How does this affect the effort to criminally go after uh, these uh, pirates and uh, also from a civil standpoint? Uh, I'll ask that to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. O'Leary. Well, I, I think that <clears throat> You know, this bill is actually speaks directly to that point. That's part of the reason there's the ability for individual uh, plaintiffs to move so that the burden does not fall solely on the Justice Department. Uh, the content industry, Pfizer. What about the criminal part, though? Because we get people well, these being are so prosecuted for sure. shoplifting and stealing little small petty items, but this is multi billion dollar white collar fraud which only the Justice Department has or should have the, uh, really has the resources and the uh, breadth of uh, law enforcement ability to address how does uh, the downsizing of uh, the Justice Department impact criminal prosecution? Well, I think as a general premise, when you downsize the Justice Department, obviously it has an impact, but let's be very clear, the Justice Department does pursue criminal cases internationally. Well, this how, is simply can, how can it do so? There's, there's, the gentleman's how, time has expired. It, thank you, Mr. Some Chairman. time ago. Uh, recognize uh, myself for five minutes. Um, well, I am a, a, a liberal. Uh, I, I, I would not accuse you of being anything else. Thank you. Well, I bear, that, friend. I bear that My shame friend. with great honor. <laughs> um, this sort of reverse of the old story that I uh, went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. Um, I, I, I came here and um, as one who has not made up his mind on this bill, um, hoping to receive information on this. And I think uh, everybody on this panel is committed to um, fighting um, piracy. I mean, maybe I'm the only member of this committee who's got a gold record. I got it from the recording industry for my work on anti-counterfeiting when I was uh, Attorney General of California. So I'm, I, I very much believe there's an important role for us to play law enforcement and um, civil law in this regard. But my concern is something that was brought to my attention as a chairman of the um, Cyber uh, Security Subcommittee on Homeland Security, and that is the existence of a system that has been uh, ongoing for some years called uh, DNS security or DNSSEC. Um, and I have heard from those, some of the engineers have been working on this in the internet area, that if we applied this law in this way, it would undo what we've been doing to try and secure the internet by way of DNSSEC or DNS security. So I'd act ask the panelists if any of you feel um, you can speak to this point because it's one that was raised with me. I'm not a technical expert on this, but with some real alarm by um, internet engineers, I would call them, who really don't have a, uh, a dog in, in this fight, but are concerned in terms of of um, the disputes between the various uh, special interests here, and, and I mean that in the proper way, special interests. Um, and, and so what I ask Mr. Clark, for instance, um, are you aware of this criticism? 
and does this legislation, would it disincentivize um, Internet service providers from using the DNS security extensions because it mandates the redirection of customers to another website? No, I'm afraid I don't. I'm, I'm not familiar with that and not a cyber. Okay. Mr. O'Leary? Well, I, I'm, I'm certainly aware of the argument uh, and the people that we've talked to. It's a, it's a concern which is frankly overstated. As I mentioned earlier in response to another question, there are numerous countries around the world that engage in this type of activity. The Internet has, has, has worked without a, a problem in regard to that. I think also, you know, they're overlooking and looking at this debate. There's an existing security problem with the current state of play, and that is these rogue sites taking private information from consumers and spreading malware and spyware and things like that. The final thing I would say is that in regard to other things, like dealing with malware, dealing with spyware, dealing with child pornography, this type of activity occurs all the time, and the Internet seems to function just fine. I tend to agree with the comments of, of Mr. Deutsch that if the Internet is going to be all things to all people, it should also be in terms of trying to help us stop people from stealing our stuff. The problem, frankly, is, is that the Internet seems to well, be portrayed as... That, that's not my point. My point is whether or not you can respond to the specific question raised by Stuart Baker, the former DHS Assistant Secretary of Policy and former NSA General Counsel, to the effect that if this approach to respond to a legitimate problem were put into effect, it would undercut an effort that's been going on for nearly a decade to secure the Internet by way of this program that I referred to. We disagree with that position. Okay. Can you submit in writing uh, for us specifically how you disagree Certainly. with that approach? Happy to. Ms. Kirkpatrick? I'm unfamiliar with that uh, element. I've, I've, I'm not aware of it. I don't have the technical expertise to comment on it. Does anybody with your organization have the expert expertise? I to certainly can on follow that? up and get back to you. Would you please respond to that specific question? Because to me, it's an underlying question that's extremely important. Having worked on the problem of cybersecurity, if what we're doing here has the unintended consequence of um, upsetting what is, at least in the um, opinion of a number of experts, and they may be wrong, I'm, I'm trying to ferret this out, uh, undercut uh, a real effort uh, that would practically help us secure the Internet, that is bothersome to me. Ms. Uh, Oyama. Sure. Um, so I think the concerns that you mentioned are the ones that we've heard as well from uh, many cybersecurity um, experts. I know um, Stuart Baker has written about this. The designers of DNSSEC themselves have published a white paper. Um, I am your, not, your, I am not uh, a cyber have your, expert. Have your people, um, yeah. do you have anybody that has expertise with your they association have, that could respond yes. to that specifically? Because I think this is absolute, This is not part of this hearing, and I'm, I'm very concerned that evidently this bill is not being referred to uh, my subcommittee, and we have, and I'm not parochial about this, but if we're going to do it, we ought to at least talk about it and to have people come here and say, well, our organization, either we don't take a position or we're not experts on this is so upsetting. I think that there is great concern within our company. Well, could DNSF. you please respond in writing on that? Sure. Could you Happy please? To. Yes. And Mr. Almeida? Uh, no, no expertise. Okay. Um, Ms. Plenty, do you have any? I think that Congress should absolutely consult objective technical experts. But what I'll add is that ICE, through operation in our sites, has been using the existing seizure and civil forfeiture laws to essentially disappear websites in the United States. So this bill would take that criminal standard and apply it to foreign sites. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's see who is next. Mr. Mar Mr. Marino is next. Sir, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. And I, I want to, uh, I think my colleague and friend, um, Ms. Lofgren and I pointed out a very good example of how easy this is on some sites and not others. I think, I think Zoe went to Bing and, and got the trailers, and I went to Google typing in free, who sent me to YouTube for the free movie. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, Ms. Ama Oyama, I want to compliment you on your decorum and your professionalism and your loyalty to your company for being here and answering the tough questions that you have been answered, uh, you've been answering. Uh, you're certainly an asset uh, to your corporation. Thank you. Nevertheless, I think it's reprehensible that the chairman 
that the CEO, that the president, that the council, none of them thought it was responsible enough for them to be here, and they sent you into the lion's den. And you certainly deserve a large portion of their bonus at the end of the year. <laughs> okay. Um, can I just add one thing? Uh, our general counsel, he was here in the spring. Um, he cares very much about this Good. problem and doing it the right way. Um, he, I think, sent a letter saying any other day he had a long-standing personal commitment for today. Any other day he would be here, and he looks forward to continuing. All right, I time. give that to him, and I, and I remove his name from that list, and he can keep <laughs> his bonus. All right? uh, let me ask you a question here. I want to thank Google for what it did for child pornography getting off the website. I was a prosecutor for 18 years and I find it commendable and I put those people away. So if you can do that with child pornography, why can you not do it on these rogue websites? And, and let me follow that up with why not hire some whiz kids out of college to come in and monitor this and, get, you know, and, and work for the company to take these off. My daughter, uh, who is 16 and my son is 12, we love to get on uh, the internet and we download music and we pay for it. And I get to a site and I say, this is a new one, this is good, we can get some music here. My daughter says, Dad, don't go near that one. That's illegal, it's free, and given the fact that you're on judiciary, uh, I don't think you should be doing that. <laughs> so it, it, it's pretty, it, uh, it sh maybe we need to hire her, but why not? So, so the two problems are similar in that they're both very serious problems. They're both um, things that we all should be working to fight against. Um, but they're very different in how you go about combating it. So for child porn, um, we are able to design a machine that can detect child porn. You can detect um, certain colors that would show up in pornography. You can detect flesh tones. You can have a manual review where someone would look at the content and they would say, this is child porn and it shouldn't appear. Um, we can't do that for copyright just on our own because any video, any clip of content, it's going to appear to the user to be the same thing. And so you need to know from the rights holder, the owner of the right, have you licensed it, have you authorized it, or is this infringement? I only have a little bit of time here, and, and, and I, I appreciate your answer, but we have the technology. Google has the technology. We have the, the, the brain power in this country. We certainly can, can figure it out. Uh, let me move on here. Uh, first of all, Mr. Clark and Mr. O'Leary, I want to thank you for your dedication to law enforcement. Uh, I, I've been down there for 18 years, and thank you so much. And Mr. Almeida, my father was a fireman for 30 years, so I know exactly what you're talking about. So I want to pose this question to anyone. It's my understanding that taking down a portion of the site is much more difficult than taking down the entire site. Uh, so I'm hearing from the testimony here. So is there a more balanced approach? that we can assist you in taking, but you take the lead on it in diffusing this problem and uh, stopping this infringement on this material, the, this the illegal stealing of our materials that uh, is costing us jobs and costing this country a lot of money. If you understand my question, please jump in, anyone. I don't think anyone understands my question. So. <laughs> Ms. Valente. Well, I, no, I appreciate the question. I don't know the answer. If, if, certainly, if uh, when when law enforcement goes before a judge and tries to get a court order that would allow it to seek relief from the website and then engage the search engines, the ISPs, the payment processors, et cetera, to help, um, they uh, they sh they would like to stop the infringing material and not the non-infringing material. I don't know if it's a technical solution or if it's just a question of each website having different pages where they can easily find the infringing content. Do any of you agree with me that we do have the brain power and the technology available to figure this out if we want to spend the money? All right. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Great. Gentlemen's time's up. Uh, Mr. Amaday, you're recognized for the last five minutes of this hearing. Thank you for that strategic uh, timing of my recognition, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And so uh, in honor of, of your discretion, I will not use the whole time. I would like to, first of all, associate myself with the comments of, uh, of my colleague from California at the end of the dais, Mr. Deutsch. Um, I think he's hit the nail on the head when you're the last guy. You don't want to try to see if you can uh, prolong things any more than usual. I would like to ask the chair, however, if, since there's written responses to this security thing, and I tried to write the guy's name down. I'm new. I don't know. Maybe it was Stuart Baker. Maybe we could have Stuart Baker's concerns in written so we could have something to compare those with. And if that's out of order, then I'll shut up on that. 
and move right along. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Baker's um, uh, article uh, was asked by unanimous consent to be part of the record, and the gentlelady, f the gentlelady from California is giving it to you right now. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you and and if I were chair, I would have him here, but I'm only temporary chair. Thank you for your compassion for someone who's been here for 61 days. Um, finally, so that I have something to yield back, uh, I, I, ap I appreciate the, the concerns and all. This strikes me as one of those deals where the pursuit of the perfect is going to get in the way of the good. Um, one thing, that, and, and I apologize for missing the, the part that I missed, but there was an opportunity to talk with some folks in another committee that's, that was kind of important. But um, I, I didn't hear anything that said, no, this is not an issue. No, this is not taking place. No, those jobs of this gentleman on the end are not being threatened. Uh, no, it's not real-time impacts when uh, Mr. Marino can dial it in and be watching it right now. Quite frankly, I think there's an issue. I don't know how you address it because nobody should leave the room thinking I'm technically savvy, but I don't have anything to type on, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, they even took my iPhone away today. So, but, but I'll tell you this. The impacts are instantaneous. Once it's downloaded, it's gone. That horse is out of the barn, and it's never coming back. And when you have a broken leg, you need to go to the hospital. And like it or not, and, and, I, and I agree with Mr. Marino's comments, um, way to go, whatever they're paying you, it's not enough. And, and uh, so if those pansies want to come by someday and say hi, tell them they're welcome. Um, so anyhow, uh, when your leg's broken, you've got to go to the hospital, and unfortunately, you're in the medical business on this stuff. And so uh, I can just tell you that my concern is this. Um, you are a major operational piece of this. The criminal activities are uncontroverted that are happening, and to do nothing is wrong. Nothing happens quick in this, in this uh, process, I believe, from my vast amount of experience, and so it's time to try something. And so while I appreciate the concerns, when I hear a recurring thing of follow the money, there's plenty of money around to follow, and, and that's a good thing. I'm a Republican. It's a good thing to make money. So um, I, I will just tell you from my perspective, it's time to move, and uh, while there are other concerns, and, and we want, um, the, if there was a perfect bill that ever came out of here, I'll, it'll sure be neat for me to be here while it happens, but I'm guessing it's not going to happen when I do. So I would appreciate best recommendations so that we can get moving on in terms of stopping something that's taken several years just to get to this point. Um, I am not picking on you. Um, and so with that, Mr. Chairman, I see the light is where it is. I yield back the most time that anybody's yield back today. Very good. The gentleman will be commended. I'd like to thank our witnesses for the testimonies today. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. We thank you all. We appreciate your testimony on a very difficult subject. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>
get you on the calendar. That'd be super. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take Thank care. You.